Howdy. During the success of the first run of Beavis and Butthead, show creator Mike Judge began working on another sitcom in a similar yet opposite vein that would go on to become King of the Hill. It featured the Hill family and their neighbors, living in the fictional neighborhood of Arlen, Texas, which was an amalgamation of various suburbs from the state, to the point where I grew up believing my town was the city's real inspiration, before talking with people from other places and finding out that almost every city in Texas makes the same claim. Judge's initial pitch was viewed with a bit of reservation by executives, who then paired him up with Greg Daniels to flesh out the initial scripts a bit more. This resulted in more character development, which, when paired with the more populist political satire of Judge's writing, created a series with characters who were entertaining enough to get us to sympathize with each of their perspectives, as various different views were given on whatever particular issue was being presented. It wrote a thin line flawlessly, of presenting two opposing arguments, and rather than demanding that audiences pick a side, instead asked us to consider the human behind the point first and foremost. The fact that the show presented such an unabashedly normal view of daily life and people gave it mixed reception early on. While many reviewers and columnists recognized the realism and relatability, King of the Hill was also critiqued for its lack of bombastic humor and inability to get a guffaw, audiences typically reacting with a more sensible chuckle. But to others, this accurate observation of life was what made the series worth taking a look at. Even today, two and a half decades after the show first aired, the humor and set pieces stand out as having aged incredibly well, warranting even a second or a third look. This video will be split into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves are split into three sections, recap, review, and wrap up. Recap is a short retelling of the events of the episode, review, a general detailing of my opinions on the episode, as well as some context for those opinions. Wrap up is for anything I couldn't find another place for. Now take off your hat and boots and crack open a cold one as we get right on into this thing. Season 1 Starting us off is an introduction by the band The Refreshments, named Yahoos and Triangles, something they typically performed at sound checks, which fits not only the tone and aesthetic of the show itself, but also serves to give the audience some time for their own sound check. Not just their television set, but expectations as well. Whereas another show might have a big showing of its entire cast or highlight its best moments, King of the Hill is content with showing a time lapse of four middle aged men standing around and drinking beers, while everyone else around them goes along with the uninteresting parts of their day. It concludes with the Hill family recreating a modern version of Grant Wood's American Gothic, a painting that once expressed American authenticity of the time, now replaced by the average American middle class Hills as a more modern mirror of ourselves. King of the Hill came out at a time where the adult animation airwaves were in the wake of The Simpsons' massive success, although that show was already being viewed by critics as having lost some of the original spark. Other competing programs included South Park and, of course, Beavis and Butthead, though the more crude and cold-hearted callousness of the characters there were often viewed with a sense of exhaustion. While each show had its own view on society and the people inside of it, only King of the Hill really took a look at America without adding on some over-the-top fluff and excitement to make the extremes stand out more. It was a show that practically defined itself by its total lack of extremes in anything. As such, it was more commonly compared to live-action sitcoms such as Married with Children or Seinfeld. And yet, despite the potentials of the medium of animation, it still failed to create characters in situations as bizarre as what Jerry or Kramer could get up to. It almost called into question why the show was animated at all. The style film Roman gave to it was crude and scratchy, with many shots being flat three-quarters perspectives of characters from the waist up. Maybe it was the fact that this stylistic choice was established and then the potential never used that actually added to the show's appeal, however. That things could have been so much more, well, animated in the medium, and yet, just as in our day-to-day -day lives, they are not. Pilot Bobby gets hit by a baseball during a Little League game and winds up with a black eye. Later, at the Megalomart, a couple overhears Hank yelling at an employee, and a rumor begins to spread about him beating his son. So a case manager from Child Protective Services comes over to the house and begins an investigation into Hank's anger management issues and whether or not Bobby should be taken into protective custody. The social worker is convinced of a domestic disturbance, but when CPS is unable to find any definitive proof, the case gets called off. 
However, only Bobby is informed of this, and he continues to use the threat of removing custody to harass his father, knowing Hank can't react due to fear of losing his son. But when Peggy Hill learns about the case being resolved, she hears from Bobby that he only lied as he was concerned Hank didn't love him because of his behavior. Ultimately, Hank has an awkward conversation with his son, where he admits that he's never been disappointed in the boy, and the episode ends happily. Hank is the central character of King of the Hill, and the pilot episode is spent establishing his character not so much in terms of who he is, but in how he reacts to the rest of the world. He tries to instill his own code of ethics and discipline into his son, but also tries to hold him at arm's length emotionally. He's frustrated with many of the systems in place in the modern world, while also relying on those systems to keep things functioning. But most importantly to the show's core themes is the fact that Hank is still willing to tolerate even the most absurd of conditions if it means doing what he thinks is right. When he learns that Bobby could be taken away, he starts repressing a part of himself by bottling up anger and becoming less effective at communicating, even if he wasn't always great about it before. But the very fact that Hank was willing to make a fool out of himself in front of neighbors and let Bobby push him around was a more genuine expression of the love he has for his son than the speech at the end of the episode. No matter how much the world angers Hank, he still puts up with anything he has to to try to keep what he's already got, and then the show never mocks him for this. Square Peg Hank and Peggy learn that Bobby is going to be taking sex ed in school, but both of them are staunchly against him learning those sorts of things from a teacher, so they agree not to sign his permission form. But when the two try explaining it to him on their own terms, they find themselves unable to get the words out and begrudgingly agree to let him learn in class. This is complicated when Peggy is chosen to be the substitute sex ed teacher following a threatening phone call from Dale, and she has to deal with the fact that she's incapable of approaching sexuality in any form. But when she's speaking with the other repressed mothers from her circle, Peggy begins to realize how important this sort of conversation is, and forces herself to learn the course material. But Hank is disgusted slash embarrassed with the fact that his wife is considering this, and once again refuses to allow Bobby to involve himself with the lesson. That is, until he realizes that his wife has put extra effort into studying, and in the end, he sends Bobby to sex ed class, only for it to be revealed that none of the other students had their permission slips signed. Hank and Peggy were raised properly and want nothing more than for Bobby to be raised the same way as them. But this type of proper upbringing doesn't exactly coincide with what's right for a child, and in some subconscious way they both know this. Peggy believes that her childhood experiences were typical, and she's right about this, but what her childhood education was not was, well, educational. As a result, she's repressed and ashamed of a completely normal aspect of the human psyche, which makes her fit in with everybody else her age. Hank is the same way, his introduction to human sexuality coming in an inappropriate manner that's caused him to grow up ashamed of himself. So while Hank and Peggy both want what's right for Bobby, they've confused this for what they had, and this is one of the core aspects of King of the Hill. The modern world is changing, for better or for worse, and they have to rapidly adapt, and in this case, the current state of Peggy and Hank's sex life is not only lacking, but hilariously so. The two are so awkward around their own minds that they struggle to function. This is a type of episode where the older generation learns that perhaps things weren't always better in the past, that the new ways of thinking brought on by the advent of the 21st century are actually on course to improve society. And as they learn to accept that fact, they also learn to accept themselves. The Order of the Straight Arrow Hank and his friends take their children out to the woods for initiation into their scout troop, Order of the Straight Arrow. The intention is to expose them to the same kind of initiation that they went through as children as a bit of fun, and they try to borrow some American Indian traditions to sell the false ideas. So the boys are taught about Wima Tanye, which is just a bunch of combined stories about nature punctuated by Hank telling them about propane. But when they're sent on a snipe hunt, that is, to hunt for a fake animal, Bobby ends up finding and then beating a whooping crane. Suddenly afraid that his son has killed an endangered species, Hank tries to hide the body, but Bobby's unwavering faith in his father prevents him from believing him when he says that the test was a fake and that they need to dispose of the corpse. Bobby thinks this is all another test. In the end, they're chased out of the park by a group of environmentalists who wind up cornering them as they're trying to dispose of the crane's body, only for the crane to wake up as it was merely unconscious. In the B-plot, Peggy sneaks out of the city and drives to Lubbock to buy oversized shoes. 
Through this episode, Hank and Dale denigrate the environmentalist efforts of a group of conservationists, calling them hippies and acting in disgust at their lifestyle. But then they also turn around and make a faux celebration of nature and the manliness of the great outdoors. That camping is the type of outdoorsy myths that can toughen them up and turn them from boys to men like it did to them. All of this coming from a version of camping that never sees them too far from a parking lot, nor from their trucks. It creates a source of irony, in the sense that a love of the outdoors is considered a positive trait, while a love of nature is considered negative. But then this episode also touches upon the fact that this sort of ideal isn't something that Hank and Co. came up with on their own. It was merely part of a tradition that's been passed on from a group to group, between generations. They were sent into the woods as a team-building exercise with no real regard for whether it worked or why. Then they try to recreate this sort of team-building as adults, only to wind up instilling onto the boys the wrong lesson. Hank and his friends snuck away from the night, but Bobby actually listened, and in observing these traditions wound up even further away from his father than he would have gotten from disobedience. Hank's Got the Willies Bobby interrupts Hank's dream about Willie Nelson when the man finds his son playing with his guitar, Betsy. Later, he finds Bobby using his mower and his golf clubs, and he starts to fear that that boy ain't right, having no direction in life and no hero to look up to. So Hank takes the boy golfing, and letting him try to tee off, Bobby accidentally hits Willie Nelson with a golf club. Hank tries to apologize, but the delirious Willie drives off in their cart. While lamenting that his chance to meet his hero went wrong, Hank tells Peggy that he regrets bringing the boy golfing, and Bobby overhears this. So he takes Hank's guitar to Willie Nelson's house to try and prove himself to his father, getting along with the guy well enough that he calls over the rest of Rainy Street for a barbecue. While there, Hank spills his problems with Bobby to Willie, and Willie shows him that, for all his mistakes, Bobby really does look up to his father. Meanwhile, Peggy is jealous over the fact that Hank seems to love his guitar more than her, and when she's about to pummel him for this, she overhears him playing a cover of Peggy Sue, which changes her mind. Hank spends the majority of this episode's start trying to get Bobby to behave more like himself, teaching him about his hobbies and his dreams. But despite Bobby clearly trying to emulate his father, Hank still doesn't make the connection that his lessons are getting through to the boy, purely because he's not doing so with the same energy Hank himself has put into his hobbies. Bobby is much more bombastic than his father, even if he more or less has the same general interests. Hank may be content to play his guitar in a calm manner, replacing the lyrics to Peggy Sue so that he's singing about a girl named Peggy instead of, well, Peggy, while Bobby is more content with attempting to emulate a comedian's routine. Ultimately, it comes down to Hank not attempting to reach out to Bobby on the boy's own level. If he had shown him proper technique in golf or guitar or even with the mower, then maybe he would be less upset with his son and would begin to see more of himself reflected in him. But because he's focusing on trying to make Bobby more like himself in the present than himself at his son's age, he narrowly misses this connection on his own. Hank lacks the patience to watch Bobby grow up, instead setting an end goal with no plan on how to get there. Luann's Saga Luann breaks up with her boyfriend Buckley and she begins crying all over the house. Hank, who wants Luann out of his den and for her to stop crying, tries to get Peggy to handle the emotional stuff, but when this process takes too long, he simply teaches Luann to bottle up her emotions the way that he does. For a while, the two get along, eating cookie dough and complaining about Buckley. But when Hank tries to get Luann a new boyfriend, she ends up getting a ride home from Boomhauer, which disturbs Hank as Boomhauer is a notorious womanizer. When he confronts Luann about this, she claims that it's none of his business who she spends time around, and Hank kicks her out. But later, during a meeting at a restaurant orchestrated by Peggy, he sees Luann crying, as Peggy claims that she's upset because Hank broke up with her. So he invites her back to the house with all her things back the way they were, inviting Luann to stay with the Hill family full time. Hank grew up in an era where the concept of men showing emotions was viewed with disgust, the commonly accepted way to handle social situations being to repress and bottle up feelings. This works in the short term, but like we routinely see with characters like Bill, can result in these feelings amplifying and coming out in unhealthy ways. Even Hank has an issue with anger management, as we saw in episode 1, showing that his own coping mechanisms often end up controlling him. And while this isn't to say that stoicism is bad, it's clear that when it comes to emotions, everything should be done in moderation, especially moderation itself. Sometimes you do need to have a big emotional moment, and it's a sign of a healthy psyche to recognize when this is. 
so Luann and Hank both had bad coping mechanisms, just on either extreme of the spectrum. While Peggy was facilitating a prolonged emotional outburst, Hank taught her to do the opposite, something that Luann found some success in purely due to it being the opposite of her current tactic. But this is really just a half-truth, as it was Hank's willingness to open himself up emotionally a bit that really caused a common ground to be found, even if he himself would never admit as much. So this episode's moral ends up revealing itself at around the halfway point, only for Hank to forget everything by the end as character continuity resets. Hank's Unmentionable Problem Hank has constipation, though Peggy is more concerned with the issue than he is, as he finds it too embarrassing to talk about. But in Peggy's concern, she starts speaking with the neighbors, who all chip in advice on what he ought to do. Finally, Peggy's concern reaches a breaking point after a bad dream of hers, and she convinces Hank to finally see a doctor, though the doctor finds no obstruction and schedules a surgery to have his colon removed. But wanting to continue living an active lifestyle, Hank starts eating nofu and drinking grease, cutting out the steaks he loves so much for more fiber, and even attending acupuncture. But when all of this fails, he and Peggy finally come to an agreement that Hank would be happier dying with the hamburger in his gut than living off of tofu. But just as he and his wife finally embrace, he feels his stomach rumbling and finally manages to pass the problem. There's a saying that a person has a stick up their butt when referring to a stubborn or uptight individual, and this is given a nearly literal interpretation during this episode. One thing implied at the end of the episode is that Hank's issue is psychosomatic, not a physical one, but a mental issue. Him closing himself off to those nearest to him also closes his bowels, and by hiding his pain and discomfort at eating salads, he's only making the problem worse. But the medical issue brings the family closer together as they all rally behind him, and that's ultimately what causes him to loosen up enough to finally flush. This, then, ties into Hank's earlier issues. He was at first embarrassed about it, going so far as to admonish his family for even trying to bring it up, despite their legitimate concerns for his health. But by the end of it all, he's willing to share how things are going with his friends and neighbors. And while Hank Hill will always be too restrained to allow himself the language, the emotional vulnerability he shows represents a marked improvement over the episode's beginning. It's this, combined with the fear of what he might lose should he lose his colon, that ultimately results in the episode's finale. Not so much a celebration of his ability to use the bathroom once more, but his ability to confide in others. Westy Side Story The neighborhood gathers around to greet the new neighbors moving next door to the Hill family, the Sufa Nusen phones, Khan, Min, and Khan Jr. Hank tries to talk down his fringe's prejudices to introduce himself, though it takes a while for the two to get along, as Khan's dog tries to mount Ladybird, and he cooks with the mesquite instead of propane. But Min and Peggy convince their husbands to try harder to get along, and eventually Hank comes around when he tastes Khan's cooking, until Dale points out that their pet dog is missing, implying they've eaten it. This is made worse when Hank overhears Min calling the pound to ask about it, assuming she's ordering another one. Around this time, Peggy starts to get jealous of the fact that Min was able to recreate her desserts, but with better seasoning. Finally, when Hank learns that Ladyburn is gone too, he demands answers from Khan, though Connie and Bobby admit that this was their fault, as they let the dogs off leash when they saw the two trying to get closer. After this misunderstanding, Hank and Khan both punished their children in the same way, and realize they're not so different after all. Hank spends most of this episode trying to prove that he's not prejudiced against his neighbor due to the color of his skin, but because of the quality of his character. Him and Peggy both leaning into stereotypes about the East to try to prove how accepting they are. But ultimately, despite believing otherwise, he still falls into the use of stereotypes and generalizations to characterize the Sufanus and Phone family once he starts to dislike them, accusing them of eating his dog out of no more evidence than Dale's conjecture. So from this, the narrative made it clear that the Hill family's attempts at proving they weren't racist were less about trying to welcome their neighbors and more to show off that they were doing so. But Khan reacts to the new situation in largely the same way. He characterizes all of his neighbors as redneck trash, and acts under the stereotype that they're all too stupid to really relate to him, something not helped by Hank's constant misinterpretations of his culture and background. So the common ground that the two men find is really less about what they do, and more so from what motivates that. After all, Khan is an anagram of Hank. It takes the two bonding over their treatment of their children and their dogs to finally understand that maybe their treatment of each other was also very similar. Shh. 
Shins of the Father. Bobby is celebrating his birthday party, and despite Peggy's attempts to prevent it, Cotton Hill receives an invite. He shows up and immediately becomes the life of the party, riding in on a horse and giving Bobby a loaded shotgun. But as he stays at the house, he starts to grade on Peggy, who resents putting up with his chauvinistic ways, and he starts to rub off on Bobby, who begins to mimic his chauvinist ways. She confronts Hank to convince him to send the man home, but Hank can't bring himself to kick out his own father, who's also a war hero. But this arguing ramps up when it's learned that Cotton is intentionally sabotaging his own car so as to continue staying with them, and it reaches ahead when Bobby starts a sexist riot at his school. And Hank learns he's planning on buying the boy a prostitute for doing so. So Hank yells at the man, kicking him out of the house and admonishing him for being a bad influence on his son. Cotton is happy that Hank's finally stood up to him, and after a lecture, Hank is able to teach Bobby not to internalize any of the behavior of his grandfather. Cotton Hill represents an interesting dynamic within the themes of King of the Hill, this theme being the constant clash between generations, when new ideas meet old traditions. Cotton Hill exists on the furthest extreme of one end of the spectrum, the oldest part of old school, and an exaggeration of every single defining trait of his generation, for better and for worse. Because he's a war hero who believes in tough love, discipline, and that men should have an extreme amount of confidence in themselves. All good traits in a vacuum, but these ideals tend to clash with reality. Confidence is fine as long as it's warranted. That sense of discipline is a good thing to have, but it has to come with an ideology that's beneficial to worship in that way. And Cotton's expression of tough love is really just a louder version of Hank's emotional distance. So of course Hank looks up to the man. All of these traits made him into the man he is in the present, so to dismiss any of his father's grating personality traits or to claim that he's a bad influence on Bobby would be to claim that he was a bad influence on Hank too, and then to claim that Hank's upbringing was imperfect and therefore so is he. But ultimately Hank ends up finding the confidence to admit that he's not perfect and that Cotton wasn't that great of a father, simultaneously stating that he's going to strive to be a much better one who accepts when he's wrong and adapts a trait that Cotton lacks the emotional maturity to confront, even if he still recognizes the feat. Peggy the Boggle Champ After winning a few friendly games of Boggle with her neighbors, Peggy hears of a tournament nearby, and despite her initial hesitations at only being a casual, she enters and wins, qualifying her for a state tournament held in Dallas. Hank is unsure about sending her there alone, until he hears about a mower show occurring the same weekend, so he signs on to be Peggy's coach as an excuse to go to the mower show. The tourney begins and Peggy starts suffering without Hank's support, something he's hesitant to give as he doesn't like walking around in a pink coach shirt while carrying her purse, and he would rather be at the mower show. But after a while the guilt sets in and Hank finally returns to the tourney, just in time to cheer her on in the finals, which she wins. Meanwhile, Bobby and Luann are left at home, desperately trying to remove a stain on the coffee table. Repeatedly through the episode, Peggy's boggle odyssey is compared to Hank's old high school experience going to state with his football team. That's repeatedly mentioned through the series as his peak, the highlight of Hank's life, with his trophy from that run being a prized possession. So when Peggy manages to earn the same attempt at going to state that he once had, he views it with a bit of hesitation, as if her run cheapens the value of his. The fact that Hank doesn't throw his support behind her until pretending to so he can see a mower show is proof of this. And while high school football is a much bigger deal in Texas than Boggle, that matters less than how much it means to the people participating. But another thing that causes some hesitation in Hank is the fact that the optics around supporting his wife look bad to his friend. Wearing a pink shirt, being Mr. Peggy Hill, and carrying her purse for her alongside all the other non-dominant husbands is something that goes against the fiber of his being. But ultimately his love for his wife wins out over his desire to appear traditionally masculine. Peggy is far from the standard housewife archetype promoted by the conservative American values that Hank tries to define himself by, and this episode is another one that contrasts his desires with these values. Keeping up with our Joneses Bobby and Joseph find a cigarette in a dumpster and Hank catches him smoking, so he forces Bobby to smoke an entire carton until he throws up, assuming that will stop the boy from getting into the habit. But while showing Bobby the right way to smoke, he himself gets hooked again, eventually spreading the itch to his wife as they reminisce about their days smoking together. 
but Hank's punishment only got Bobby hooked, as well as the rest of the family aside from Luann, who's trying to shame the others into quitting again, using the same techniques she's been using to get Ladybird to stop eating her makeup. They try going to support groups and using nicotine patches, but nothing works until eventually Luann locks them in a room until they quit. The next morning, they wake up to a smoke-free lifestyle. Smoking, like almost every other cultural clash so far, is one of those things so thoroughly ingrained into American society that had to be forced out through reason over decades. Today, it exists as a relic of those who refuse to move on to the lives they made for themselves, do more to what it represents rather than anything else, made worse by the fact that nicotine itself is addictive. To Hank and Peggy, smoking is nostalgic, reminding them of the good old days through rose-tinted glasses when the reality of the situation was lung cancer, black teeth, and a smoker's cough. Even Hank's approach to getting Bobby off of smoking was viewed as something wrong to do, despite his intentions being in the right place. The idea that you can get someone off smoking by making them smoke more instead of having your kid listen to reason. Through the episode, we also get subtle indications of how the industries surrounding tobacco have profiteered off of this addiction. Between Dale showing a cartoon aimed at kids to inform Joseph about tobacco, and the advertising targeted towards children that caused Bobby's discomfort. There's a clear signal that an industry will use this sense of nostalgia for old America and the way things used to be in order to hook customers and keep them around. That they can turn a person's consumption into an ideology and later part of their personality means that you can get individuals who will staunchly defend something bad for them as they view data and evidence as personal attacks. King of Ant Hill Hank Hill is celebrating his great lawn, but notices that it's not quite as good as Khan's, so he ramps up his game with St. Augustine. But when Dale comes by to spray his lawn for bugs, he turns the guy down, saying he doesn't want to risk any potential damage right before the street's Cinco de Mayo celebration. So Dale secretly sneaks in the Fire Ant Queen to his lawn, and the following morning there's an infestation. Hank tries a few eco-friendly solutions that Dale also sabotages, and eventually he has to turn back to his old friend to spray his lawn once more. But Dale uses far too much poison, and the lawn dies, causing Hank to collapse from the stress. In the B-plot, Bobby takes a fire ant queen as a pet, only for her pheromones to control his mind into raising the colony, and eventually taking them outside, where he's swarmed by the ants. This then connects to the A-plot, where Hank is about to kick Dale's ass before being interrupted by a swarm of ants attacking Bobby. So Dale volunteers his hand as bait, which the ants take. This saves Bobby at the cost of thousands of ant bites to Dale, though he's resistant to them after years of working with insects. In the end, the neighborhood comes together to offer Hank their own grasses in order to replace his lawn with bits of their own. Lawn maintenance is one of those things so uniquely American that it would inevitably become a part of Hank's identity. Like the previous episode though, it's also one of those things promoted by a corporate interest out of a need to offload excess nitrogen following World War II. This led to a fertilizer boom and the follow-up of chemical companies encouraging Americans to raise lawns as a pastime. Which this combined with the VA loan program, we had a whole generation of people who'd never owned homes before discovering that they had to consume products to raise grass, similarly to the way most traditions in America start. And knowing how this sort of belief got into Hank's mind helps us to understand why it's so valuable to him. He conflates a well-manicured lawn with a resume of sorts, at once espousing your patriotism and work ethic, the two things Hank loves about himself the most. So when his friendship with Dale ends up getting in the way of a well-manicured lawn, it ends up being something that hurts Hank's self-image. He doesn't want the association of a bad lawn, so he breaks things off with Dale. Of course, what's the point of showing off a good face if you're going to be a bad neighbor underneath it all? This is a lesson Hank learns by the end of the episode making up with his friend as a true showing of his character, rather than the optics brought by a well-manicured lawn. Plastic White Female Bobby gets invited to a boy-girl party for Joseph's birthday, but he's nervous about interacting with the opposite sex as he has no experience. This, and the fact that Peggy seems to baby him. But when Luann brings home a plastic head from her beauty school, Bobby notices it and thinks it might make good practice for a real woman. Luann is nervous about her beauty school final and wants to practice on anybody who will let her before styling the mannequin, but Hank is hesitant to allow her near his hair. Meanwhile, Bobby is practicing romancing the head and is starting to become less nervous around women, until learning that Joseph plans on playing spin the bottle at his party. So Bobby prepares to practice kissing on the head when Peggy walks in on him. 
Hank and Peggy are disturbed by the news as they believe it's a fetish thing, but when Bobby goes back to practice again, Hank destroys the head with his skill saw. Luann is distraught over the destruction of her beauty school project, so Hank finally volunteers to replace it. When Luann fails during her final, Hank praises his haircut, which causes the instructor to go back on the failing grade and pass Luann. Back at the party, a nervous Bobby meets with Connie on his way to Joseph's house, and the two agree to practice kissing together, giving Bobby the confidence needed to play spin the bottle, but ultimately going after Nancy Gribble when she walks in on the game. Bobby is emotionally stunted due to the constant split of his brother's coddling, with his father's insistence on treating him like an adult despite this. These mixed messages mostly confuse the boy, who had otherwise been content to take things at his own pace. But the pressure from his father, combined with the lack of experience ensured by his mother, ensures that Bobby gets put into uncomfortable situations with nowhere near enough knowledge to cope with them. So he resorts to the same kind of weird strategies that any overly sheltered kid would gravitate towards, in this case being Luann's beauty school project. Hank and Peggy's reaction to his eccentricity is a negative one, less out of a concern for their son, and more out of a concern for their own parenting methods. If he turns out this way, it reflects poorly on themselves. Yet ironically enough, Bobby's practice actually does result in making him more confident, instead of more weird and isolated. The very fact that he believes he has the experience is enough to get him over the nerves and to realize that women are just people. This is a lesson reinforced at the end of the episode when he and Connie meet up before Joseph's party. She's been around the boy for a while now, and he's never had any awkward feelings with her. So all his hangups are very surface level. The boy ain't right, but he ain't too wrong either after all. Season 2 The first season of King of the Hill stood out due to its subversive nature in the sense that it wasn't subversive at all. The plots were incredibly down-to-earth, the characters relatable and realistic, and this went against the grain of what was typically seen in animation. The second season then doubled down on many of these aspects of the show in the visual department. Most characters were redesigned to have the crudeness buffed out, with fewer off-model shots, reminiscent of Beavis and Butthead, getting through, while a facelift of sorts was given to each major character. And yet, in spite of the added realism to the cast, the plots began to diverge from this trend. While the realm of realism was still very much played straight, the extent to which these boundaries were getting pushed moved outwards. The misunderstandings that fueled plots were often things that no sane person would do, but still things that a sane person could do. Plots were larger than life, but not cartoonishly so. The kind of thing you'd hear about in gossip after it's been passed around a few times. But this isn't to say that any of these changes are false. As with any show, the first season saw a lot of shakiness as characters tried to find their footings. What to really do with each member of the major cast was starting to come together as the writers developed around what was working and what got exhausting too fast. And this compromise with the added realism came through the side characters. New characters would be introduced for a single plotline, with these characters often being the caricatures one would expect from a contemporary show, while keeping the main cast and their reactions consistent. So Hank and Co can stay relatable while the plotlines themselves grew, giving the show a consistent aspect of heart while also making a sort of character out of its uniquely mundane setting. How to Fire a Rifle Without Really Trying Hank learns that Bobby is a natural marksman at the state fair and decides to take him on a father-son shooting trip. But when Hank himself tries to shoot, he finds himself unable to fire without flashing back to his father's verbal abuse. Despite his inability to fire, Bobby is still smitten with the hobby, and the two sign up for a father-son tournament. Though Hank is struggling to get over his hangups and continuously tries to quash Bobby's interest in the sport, something that Bobby eventually interprets as his father not wanting to spend time with him. But when Peggy tells Hank to get over himself for his son's sake, Hank decides to go to a sports psychologist. The consult eventually results in Hank getting over his fears by thinking about something else, and he's soon able to shoot alongside Bobby once again. On the first day of the tourney, the team is performing well, tied for first, until Cotton Hill arrives and starts to taunt Hank. Unable to focus on anything but his father's voice, Hank ends up choking the final shot. But Bobby is still ecstatic about their second place finish, and the two leave the range proudly. Throughout the episode, Hank is trying to lower Bobby's expectations by telling him niceties along the lines of doing your best or only participating for fun, the opposite of what he usually says, calling back to the first episode where the family discusses giving 110% and playing to win. To Hank, these are the words of a quitter, the type of person who's lost before they even started, 
and he still believes as such, which makes saying it all that much harder. Ironically enough, the fact that he was pretending to think this way was ultimately what gave this episode a happy ending. Bobby had been internalizing this method of thinking from the start, so when they did get second place, he was content because it was never about the trophy. Bobby and Hank are able to bond over shooting rather than victory, and while contemporary shows may have made a big deal over the episode's central focus, Firearms, King of the Hill manages to ride a more centrist line. Guns are not inherently viewed as a bad thing, but the people who obsess with them are still at the receiving end of many of the episode's jokes. The Arlen Gun Club is portrayed as obsessed lunatics, who are more likely to shoot themselves than anyone or anything else, but Hank and Bobby handle their firearms more or less responsibly the whole time. So rather than the episode taking the low-hanging fruit of saying, guns are dangerous, it instead makes a position that idiots with guns are dangerous, the gun itself being a tool like a bandsaw or a hammer. Texas City Twister When Hank receives a notification of six months of owed rent on a trailer house in Luann's name, he realizes that his niece has had a home all along, and that it simply needed to be flipped to be livable. Eager to get her out of his hair, he flips the trailer back so Luann can start arranging it to be livable, but his less than emotional goodbye gets Peggy mad, and he ends up insulting her as she leaves, just in time for a news report about a tornado hitting Arlen. Believing his wife is in danger, he sets out to warn them as Bill is deployed to maintain order, and Boomhauer and Dale use the dead bug truck to catch footage of flying cows. Despite a few obstacles, Hank manages to make it to the trailer park just in time, but Peggy and Luann have already hunkered down just when the tornado arrives. While holding on to a telephone pole for his life, Hank is finally able to bear everything, emotionally, and when Luann's trailer house is tipped over again, he agrees to let her continue to stay with the Hill family. Hank Hill is not an emotional man, remaining stoic and proud of it in almost any situation, even going so far as to avoid potentially awkward situations where he might be forced to present some vulnerable side of himself. But even though he usually manages to come around by the end of the episode, the in-between often gets him into trouble as his lack of emotional response to what goes on around him can be interpreted incorrectly. People have a tendency to project something they're feeling onto him, such as in this episode when Peggy is sad to see Luann go and conflates Hank's emotionlessness with complacency or satisfaction. She gets mad at him for enjoying the fact that he's kicked his niece out of the house and Hank does not make an effort to make her believe otherwise. So showing emotions can, in many cases, be the right option to prevent further harm later on. It usually takes something over the top to prove that you've changed. To simply return to normal following an event like this will come across as insincere at worst, so Hank could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he'd been more clear with his intentions early on. It's the equivalent of telling somebody no when they invite you to a place you really don't want to go. Awkward to say it in the moment, but it saves you the trouble of faking a smile later. The Arrowhead Hank finds an arrowhead and a few other American Indian artifacts in his yard and sells them to a local archaeologist, Professor Lerner, for a few dollars. Peggy is upset about this, claiming she could have used them to educate Bobby. Then, when Lerner comes back around with a permit to dig in the hills' his yard, she signs it to approve a new site. Over the next few days, Hank's lawn is torn up by the professor, who Peggy looks up to while Hank hates the guy's guts and know-it-all attitude. But when he later sees a Wahasha bracelet on Peggy's wrist, Hank gets jealous and plans to sabotage the professor's career by creating a faked artifact for him to dig up. But Peggy finds it instead and is made fun of for misidentifying it. So Hank confesses his scheme, apologizing to Peggy and admitting that he missed spending time with her. She realizes that she's been too obsessed with the dig lately, and that Lerner's ego made him a bad person, and then the two make up. This episode doesn't really dissolve the external plot of its story by the end. Lerner still has a permit to dig up Hank's lawn, and can't technically be forced to leave. But from his personality, we can tell that this was never the true issue the episode was focused on exploring. The obstacle was not Lerner's violation of Hank's lawn, but the fact that doing so was fueled by his own ego. So by the end of the episode, it's his ego that's damaged by Peggy losing the respect she had for him and looking like a jerk in front of his students. This being resolved, he's less likely to stick around somewhere where he's not wanted at the risk of looking bad. But this episode is much less about the dig site or the professor, and much more about the argument between Hank and Peggy. 
Hank sells the artifacts at the beginning of the episode without asking Peggy first. This prompts her to try to get revenge by signing off on the dig without asking Hank. Everything surrounding this is merely the result of the two passive-aggressively trying to avoid talking about why they're mad. Hank claims it's his lawn, but it's actually Peggy. Peggy claims she's doing this for Bobby's future, but it's really Hank that she has the issue with. So just explaining the problem out loud was all it took to resolve the issue. It's not that anybody even needed to learn a lesson or change their mind, just that they had to reiterate what they were already feeling. Halloween. Hank is put in charge of the school's haunted house, excited to put his craftsman skills to work, but when a litigious evangelical named Junie Harper claims that the holiday is satanic, she gets the haunted house shut down. But Hank wants Bobby to have an authentic trick-or-treating experience and teaches the boy how to put the trick into trick-or-treat by vandalizing Harper's house. She runs over her cat while trying to chase them down and blames the dead cat on satanists, leveraging this to get the holiday banned across the county. Hank is distraught over this, even more so as Harper was able to indoctrinate Luann with a few niceties, who then tries to spread the satanic panic to Bobby. But when Hank learns that Junie is hosting a hallelujah house full of religious fear-mongering and that Bobby's going, he takes to the streets to march and demand the holiday back. The neighbors all join in, even Luann, until they reach Junie's house, where Bobby and the rest of the children realize the fun they're missing out on and go with the Halloween Hellraisers. Junie Harper is an extremely frustrating antagonist for this plotline due to the fact that she really does exist. Maybe not in the exact form of Junie Harper, but everyone growing up knew some hyper-religious type who lauded their virtue over others in an attempt to gain control, banning things less out of actual concern for anyone's well-being than to show off that they could do it. King of the Hill is a very down-to-earth and realistic show, including its characters. As such, it can create fictional characters who are just like the kind of people we know and loathe, and this makes her a much more compelling villain for the Hill family to deal with because everyone knows a Junie. This episode also puts into perspective Hank's desire to raise his kids right, despite knowing contradictory to his own youth. He was a vandal as a kid who disobeyed his parents and acted in an entitled manner towards things like Halloween candy, and yet he tries to raise his son to be like himself as an adult, conflating the good times he had as a kid with his current worldview. It would come across as hypocritical if you didn't think that Hank truly believed in it, and optically this comes across as he tries to encourage Bobby to misbehave in the same vein. This is part of why Bobby is eager to accept the indoctrination of Junie Harper. Jumpin' Crack Bass Hank tries to teach Bobby about the wonders of digging up your own bait to use live worms as he believes it's the only honest way to go fishing. But when they're out there, his car gets hotwired and Hank performs a citizen's arrest on the culprit. Later on, when he's the only one on the lake that day not to catch anything, he tries to find some better bait and gets directed to a street corner where he ends up buying some synthetic bait. Despite his friends pointing out his hypocrisy, they still end up using the bait themselves and are wildly successful until Hank runs out of bait and needs another, stronger batch. In Dale's exterminator wisdom, they've adapted to the new element. When buying more drugs, Hank, and Dale who followed him, get arrested, and the judge doesn't buy his fishing bait story. But as he was the judge who presided over Hank's citizen arrest from before, he gives the guy a chance to catch fish using his synthetic bait to prove the story. But when the bait doesn't work, Hank goes back to using worms in secret and manages to catch a fish that proves his innocence. The story here begins with a lie and ends the same way. Hank tries to talk about the virtues of fishing honestly, that enjoying the quiet atmosphere of nature is the true appeal of going out to the lake, but ends up getting jealous of his friends when they catch more than he does. So he lies about his new bait and the advantages it's giving him, betraying his own words of wisdom in favor of having more fun. But this goes wrong and ultimately is about to result in Hank getting arrested for his repeat purchase. It's only by deceiving the judge that Hank is able to earn his freedom, using his old tried and true method to fake an innocent count. And while this comes across as a story about Hank learning the virtues of his own honesty, it really is a story of two wrongs cancelling out to make a right. The episode itself develops in a way that's meant to mimic the habits of an addict. Hank is, at first, secretive about his use of the new bait. He only hesitantly allows his friends to use a bit themselves, and they immediately get hooked, pun not intended. But as the episode goes on, Hank wants another day on the lake again and again, skipping sleep and time with his family to go fishing with his new bait, with less and less of a pretense for why he's going out. 
A subtle thing this episode also does is establish the Megalomart as a negative force within the town of Arlen. In a brick joke, Layaway Ray burns down his own store for the insurance money due to not being able to compete. This, and Hank's complaints about the Megastore, set up what would ultimately be the second season's finale, but I'll talk more about that when it comes up. Husky Bobby When Bobby is too big to fit into new clothes at a children's clothing store, they're recommended to go to a plus-size store instead. But Hank and Peggy don't want to hurt Bobby's feelings over going to the fat kid store and try to let him down gently, erring too far on the side of caution as Bobby embraces the new fashion. He's offered a role as a plus-sized model, but Hank shoots this idea down, forcing Bobby to sneak out with Luann to intend the shoot instead. This shoot is successful, and he's scouted to go to more and more of them, eventually getting to go to a husky boy fashion show at the mall. When Hank learns about this, he rushes there to stop his son from walking the catwalk and gets there just in time for an argument. But as he's dragging Bobby away, a group of teenagers begin to throw donuts at the fat kids, and Bobby realizes that his father saved him from humiliation. Confidence is important. Having confidence in yourself is one of the key factors to success in anything, because it's what gives us the motivation to bother to start in the first place. Hank and Peggy recognize this, which is why they avoid telling Bobby that he's fat in the first place, using alternative language like special. When he begins to embrace his size, the rest of the world embraces it too. Bobby's confidence is what makes him a good model. But confidence alone only gets you so far, because loving yourself doesn't guarantee that others are going to love you the same amount. Believing that you are going to do well is one thing, but believing that others are going to view your actions the same way is just naivety. Not everyone is going to treat you with respect. Not just a thing for fat models, but general life advice. It's not that you should be ashamed, but you should recognize that some people are going to attack you for any amount of vulnerability whatsoever. And while Hank's actions in shutting down Bobby's dreams of modeling are a bit extreme, he ends up being justified by the narrative in his actions. It would have been far more traumatic for Bobby to get the donut-flavored reality check than to be let down gently as he was by Hank, and even that was not a simple sight. If Hank and Peggy had maybe been a bit more honest with Bobby from the start, he might have been more prepared for this sort of awakening to the cruelty of teenagers, but on the other hand, he likely would have lacked the confidence to get scouted for the fashion show in the first place. The Man Who Shot Kane Skretberg Hank is annoyed at a group of teenagers led by Kane Skretberg who are playing music too loud, so he goes over to complain, but they ignore him and he leaves angrily. But later, when Bobby and Joseph are attacked by the group in a paintball game, Hank gets his friends together to teach them a little bit of respect. But they're humiliated in front of the other adults when the teenagers fire on them despite surrendering. Hank starts to feel like he's becoming an old man, so he challenges them to a rematch, only to lose again. The alleyway starts to fear that they finally become old men, and they resign to their fates, only to get shot at by the teens once again. Not knowing why the teenagers won't leave them alone, they decide to investigate, researching teen attitudes to learn how they tick. The following day, they challenge the band to another paintball batch, wagering Bill's leaf blower against their ability to use electric instruments. They use the teens' cruelty and hormones against them, with Hank finally managing to outsmart and outmaneuver Kane, winning back peace and quiet on the block. Hank, Dale, Boomhauer, and Bill all peaked in high school, the exact moment being during their excursion to the state championship football game. But as it is with people who reach their peak of life satisfaction, they try to cling on to those days. It's why, when Hank tries to intimidate the teens, he references his football career and school days. But when he starts to face the reality of the situation, this crutch of his past no longer works, and he begins to understand that he's old. His old man mentality comes from the fact that he's no longer the guy he imagines himself as. Hank's mental image of himself is how he looked in high school, where he was a person that no longer exists. But he is able to find the motivation to challenge the boys to a rematch after a pep talk from Peggy. During this talk, she doesn't talk about his football career or any of the things he did in high school, but instead references current events of his life, his career in propane, chasing raccoons out of the attic, and being a father. This pep talk doesn't work either, but it does start the trend of actively trying to buck the mentality of being washed up and elderly, which then evolves into their attempts to reclaim their youth, not by simply talking about doing it, but by actively trying to understand teenagers to beat them at their own game. In the end, Hank and Co. only believe themselves to be old. It's their actions that really define their age. The Sun That Got Away 
Connie and Bobby get in trouble at school for disrupting class together, and both their parents are called over to correct them. And while there, they blame each kid's behavior on the other's bad parenting. Both kids are punished, so they decide to get out of the punishment by sneaking away, with Bobby bringing Joseph along too. He suggests that the trio go to the caves to explore, and they get trapped down there. While stuck, Bobby begins to notice that Connie and Joseph are getting close, so he volunteers his body as food for them, assuming they'll be trapped down there for a while. Meanwhile, Dale, Hank, and Con set out with the rest of the neighborhood to track down their kids, ultimately learning that they went to the caves, much to Hank's horror as the caves are where Arlen teenagers go to make out. Hank and Con crawl deeper into the caverns, only to get lost themselves, and while down there they start to reminisce about their own teenage years, eventually getting along. Their laughter echoes through the caves, leading the two groups to reunite and eventually be discovered by Boomhauer, who calls the fire department for a rescue. In the end, Bobby and Joseph both claim that Connie has a crush on the other, and the two remain friends. This episode sets up a love triangle between Bobby, Connie, and Joseph, though this is an aspect of the plot that doesn't really stick around for too long afterwards. Largely, this is because it's counterintuitive for a lot of the characterization set up before and afterwards. Most of Connie's hangups around dating Bobby come from her father's disapproval at the girl hanging around rednecks, and this is something that would persist no matter who she chose. Bobby is far too good-natured to ever let a love triangle ruin a friendship, something that he expresses during this very episode as he resolves to sacrifice himself for his friends' sake. And Joseph is still very much being developed as of now, also moving away from this iteration. It's a plot dynamic that the writers established, then realized couldn't be used very much, throwing it out before they risked it getting stale or annoying. Fox initially wanted King of the Hill to be a totally standardized show, the episodes being watchable in any order. But the showrunners recognize the damage this could do to realism. After all, real people hardly stay consistent throughout their lives. So there are subtle traits that change in some episodes to get picked up later. Character relationships will change, statuses change, and the world itself changes too. The Company Man While helping Bobby with a Sunday school report on his hero, Hank Hill, Hank Hill receives word of a new account from a Mr. Holloway, a Boston man who is visiting Texas to choose a gas supplier. Holloway is obsessed with Texas, or at least the idea of it, and wants Hank to give him a tour of cowboys, oil wells, and six-shooters. This goes contrary to Hank's idea of salesmanship, giving an honest examination of the advantages of propane rather than selling the idea of the product. It begins to look as though Hank is about to lose the contract to Thatherton, a man who left Strickland Propane eight years ago and has been poaching their clientele ever since. So he swallows his pride and begins to play up his southern drawl and other fake aspects of who he is. Bobby starts to get a confused idea of who his father is, and soon, Hank is even going to strip clubs to win the client over. But after seeing how similarly dressed he is to a stripper and how similar their behavior is, Hank decides to keep his pride and he turns down the sale. This episode has Hank fighting against the stereotype of Texas as portrayed by spaghetti westerns and Hollywood interpretations of the state. The truth of the matter is that Texas is nowhere near the stereotype that it's portrayed as with tumbleweeds and the like. King of the Hill is actually an accurate depiction of what life is like in the Lone Star State. But there's an interesting hitch to this idea. The Quebec dub of King of the Hill recontextualizes the setting to no longer take place in a suburb of Texas, but instead a suburb in Canada. Nothing else has changed outside of replacing a few flags and a few lines from the script, and yet the show still met an audience up north as well. So how Texan can the show be if it also fits so many Canadian stereotypes? The modern era of society has caused so many changes to culture, specifically the conglomeration of it. Cities will look similar no matter where you go because they're all built out of the most efficient and available materials. Popular food and music becomes much more the same cuisine and culture as it penetrates borders. Texas these days is as much like Canada as Canada has become like Texas, and for the real thinker, propane and propane accessories are often considered fake grilling components. For all the talk around Hank Hill being a true Texan, he grills with the gas equivalent of an automatic transmission. Or, for the computer nerds, it's as though Hank calls himself a tech guy and exclusively sells and uses Macs. The biggest lie King of the Hill ever sold was the lie that Texans grilled with propane instead of a real fuel. Bobby Slam Bobby signs up for a sports class, choosing wrestling as his team of choice. Meanwhile, Connie signs up for General Sports, a class for girls being taught by Peggy. 
General Sports is underfunded and repeatedly kicked out of their practice area. After being turned down for a budget increase, she remembers her childhood, the way she wasn't allowed to try out for the softball league because of her gender, and gets angry. She asks the girls if there are any sports that they want to play, and Connie replies that she wants to join the wrestling team. The wrestling coach, Kleehammer, is distraught about having to teach a girl, so he takes out his frustrations on Bobby as a way to get back at Peggy. Bobby will be wrestling Connie during the team's tryouts, a lose-lose situation for him. Between his insecurity about how to handle the situation, and Connie getting bullied for trying to join the team, both fighters are nervous about the situation. But on the actual day of the fight, Bobby and Connie avoid a real wrestling match, instead staging a grand spectacle with chairs and mind control to ensure that nobody loses. Connie and Bobby's fight in this episode is a surrogate for so many other fights from various characters. Hank is trying to promote Bobby's wrestling career as a substitute for his own glory days, living vicariously through his son. Peggy is also trying to encourage the fight as she's hoping to prevent the wrongs inflicted on her as a young girl, when she wasn't taken seriously as a competitor. The wrestling coach and most of the school are trying to enforce a status quo of sorts, with various motivations from plain cruelty to, as it's implied, budgetary concerns that they couldn't fund the lavish equipment for the high school football team if they allowed women in sports. Khan and Min even try to promote Connie's career in order to improve her college chances, and so they can brag about their daughter. Bobby and Connie are the victims in this, at first only joining the wrestling team because it looked like a way to have fun, and then getting swept up in all the politics surrounding the sport. Bobby even starts to mimic the regressive attitudes of his father, without really understanding why that mentality might cause harm to his friend. And Connie is excited to wrestle as she's internalized the struggles of Peggy and women all over the world. In the end, the politics that the parents try to shove into their kids' sporting events doesn't really benefit anybody, least of all the kids who are the true victims. The Unbearable Blindness of Laying The Hill family is celebrating Christmas and Hank's mother Tilly is coming over to visit alongside her new gentleman friend, Gary Kasner. Hank is uncomfortable around his mother's boyfriend, even if the rest of the family doesn't think the same way, and he tries to avoid talking with the guy by pretending to, instead, be interested in a televangelist. But later, when Hank accidentally walks in on the two making love on the kitchen table, he undergoes a psychological blindness. He tries to ignore the blindness for as long as possible, eventually going to Cotton's house to celebrate with him while Gary comes along too. Cotton disparages Tilly while Hank and Gary are over, and Gary yells at him, coming to her defense. Later, Hank seems grateful for this as the two are in line to be healed by the televangelist Hank saw earlier, meant to be a Christmas present from Gary despite their differing faiths. And when he finally accepts Gary as his new dad, his vision returns. Like in the season 1 episode, Hank's unmentionable problem, this episode deals with a psychosomatic disorder involving Hank that manifests itself physically. And like that episode, Hank refuses to acknowledge this issue and tries to simply live around the problem, hoping things will work out anyway. The difference then comes down to the fact that Hank's blindness is actually diagnosed properly right away. He knows precisely what will fix it, and he simply refuses to do so. Part of this stems from Hank's inability to move on from the past, specifically that he assumes that Cotton's relationship with Tilly was a typical one. He's internalized that his father's cruelty towards women, and rather than uniquely acknowledging that his dad was bad and should not have been looked up to, believes that any man who lives with Tilly will treat her the same way. Between this and a bad first impression, Hank makes up his mind about Gary before they even get to their house. This is made worse when Hank refuses to try to find any sort of conflicting evidence that might make the guy look any better. Instead of trying to face the truth, he intentionally avoids it, so his problems, his eyesight and his stepfather, still remain in his head. Meet the Manger Babies After Luann gets blown off by Buckley, she starts to get depressed, lamenting that nothing good ever happens to her. But she finds a box of puppets at a garage sale and comes up with the idea for The Manger Babies, a puppet show about the animals from Jesus' manger. She performs it at a local Sunday school, but the show ends abruptly and she starts to lose the audience. That is, until Hank steps in to try to fix a loose nail on the set and ends up pretending to have a role that gets the audience's attention back. Luann loves the role Hank played and gives him the future role of God in her next show, which airs live on Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. Hank refuses to go as he's hosting the game that year, and Luann starts to go back into her melancholic mood from the start of the episode. 
but when Peggy guilts him by changing the channel to the other station repeatedly, he finally decides to go to the station and reprise his role as God, saving the manger babies. Luann is practically the opposite of Hank emotionally, yet their coping mechanisms are nearly identical. While Luann is very outspoken about the way she feels and expresses herself loudly and often, Hank is much more reserved, bottling up his feelings and keeping everything to himself. And when he encounters a situation that he's not emotionally ready or able to handle, his response is to find some sort of busy work to distract from it. Here, Luann is distraught over Buckley, again, and isn't able to control herself until she sets her mind to the puppet show, the amount of work she puts in being sufficient to distract her from a less healthy method of expression without action. It's something that Hank helps to set off, buying the puppets in the first place, and then something that he ends up trying to avoid seeing through to the end, hoping to instead focus on setting up for the Super Bowl party. But as the Manger Babies' success is the axis on which Luann's mental state is hinging, it's much more important to her than he initially realizes, and when she starts reflecting her childhood onto Joe Sixpack, Hank finally realizes this and rushes to her aid. It's not that he was being neglectful willingly, but that his own emotionally stunted mind couldn't realize how important the puppet show was to his niece. Snow Job The town of Arlen encounters bad weather and there's a propane emergency, with Strickland ramping up their sails to accommodate the freeze. But when Buck Strickland has a medical emergency, he needs to elect a new interim manager, and he passes over Hank for a business major named Lloyd Vickers. Vickers immediately begins modernizing the business, putting tattlers on the trucks and price gouging customers due to increased demand. This is made worse when Hank is feeding Buck's hounds and learns that the guy has an electric stove. Then when he confronts his boss, learns that his loyalty to propane gas is merely a business tactic. So Hank goes to a cabin in the woods to unwind, where he decides to open a people-centric general store. Yet, upon returning to Arlen, Hank learns that all of the truck drivers for Strickland have quit in protest of the working conditions, and that people are freezing in their homes. So he rallies up a temporary group of tow truck drivers, as they don't need hazmat certification, to save Arlen, and he returns to his old job. Lloyd Vickers, despite being portrayed as an incompetent businessman who nearly drives Strickland out of business, is, in truth, doing the right thing for the situation based on the ideals of capitalism. Basic economics dictate that raising prices in an emergency is the right thing to do if your goal is to make as much money as possible, and tracking truck drivers to make sure they work more efficiently is just common business sense. But these strategies fail despite being, on paper, correct. And when Hank talks to Buck Strickland about his electric stove and learns that he's just doing what makes the most financial sense, he has a crisis of ideology. The political ideology of King of the Hill is a very consistent one, not lining up with any particular political belief or party platform, but instead is a message of populism. Hank is a loyal American citizen, extolling the virtues of capitalism and the free market. He also feels a strong sense of connection to his community and the things that built that community. But when the free market is what causes so many wrongs to be inflicted to the community around him, the two ideals in his head clash. Ultimately, he does learn that the people ought to come before profits, and that this even has a ripple effect on repeat business and goodwill. And so the messaging of the show isn't anti-capitalism, as it recognizes that people's opinions are a form of capital in itself. I Remember Mono Hank and Peggy regale the tale of how the first Valentine's Day the couple spent together. Peggy was planning on making a meal for him, but he threw out his back and couldn't make it. Convenient, as Peggy had failed at cooking and was not prepared to reveal her lack of abilities, and merely described the meal to him over the phone. But when Peggy is substituting in the records room of his old high school, she learns that he hadn't thrown out his back, but gotten mono, and that he'd gotten it from a girl. Peggy tracks this girl down and learns that the kiss that spread the sickness was a one-off event, but she's still upset that Hank lied to her all those years ago, as that was one of their best stories. Hank tries to win back her affection through a series of romantic gestures, but these don't work, until she's complaining to her friends about them and begins to realize how much the attempts mean, later recreating that same phone call. Meanwhile, Bobby tries to prep for a visit from his secret admirer, who he believes is Olympic athlete Carrie Strug, only to find out that it was really his grandmother all along. A lot of the romance in Peggy and Hank's life comes from momentum, not the affection they show for each other in their day-to-day -day lives, but the grand gestures between the couple in the past, those moments that proved how strongly they felt. 
So when Peggy learns that one of their biggest early moments was based on a lie, it damages the rest of the relationship as it destroys the foundation upon which it was built. It takes Hank trying and failing to recreate this moment that finally brings her to the realization at the episode's end. Hank and Peggy's relationship is a very strong one for a TV couple, not because of big moments, but because of the thousands of small ones. While Hank may be terrible at expressing himself, he does let this guard down a little bit around his wife, who's always been extremely supportive of him during his lowest moments. It's actually Hank's failure to be romantic that proved how bad he was at it, and that being bad at something comes with genuinely trying. It's not that Hank is a romantic guy, it's that he tries to be one. And so in the end, there's no grand gesture that salvages their relationship, but instead, the mere concept of one, fitting in that they initially bonded over the idea of a meal, instead of the meal itself. Three Days of the Condo When Khan's brother backs out of a split condo in Mexico, he decides to rube Hank into splitting the bill with him, inviting the Hill family to vacation with them. The two feud with each other in several small ways as they go south of the border, but when Khan learns that they only rented the bottom floor of the condo, he breaks into the top one and allows the Hills to stay up there. They all go their separate ways upon arriving in Mexico and settling in, with Bobby and Connie buying a massive firework that turns out to be a dud, Luann purchasing banned makeup products that she intends to sneak across the border, and Peggy is asked to deliver a present across the border that Min convinces her is drugs. When the police show up to investigate the break-in of the top floor, Dale followed them and spilled the beans, each of them believes that they're the ones who are in trouble. Ultimately, Hank is ordered to pay 10,000 pesos to the condo owner and has his ID confiscated until he can get the money. But unable to pay, Hank, Con, and Dale simply sneak up north illegally. Hank and Con's relationship is one that varies wildly throughout the show's run. Sometimes they get along, sometimes they hate each other, sometimes their issues get resolved, sometimes they stay upset. But both characters are the type to obsess over similar things. In the realm of appearances, Hank is very concerned with the condition of his lawn and how that reflects on him, while Khan is very concerned with his property and how people compare the two. Yet Khan spends much more time and effort towards these appearances than Hank does, so despite coming across as being more well-off, he's actually in a much worse position, seen here when he realizes he can't actually afford a condo for a weekend. But what separates the two is how they approach the idea of appearing well-off. When Khan is better at something than somebody, he tries to rub it in, to call more attention to his position to play up his own greatness, a performative act that's for the benefit of himself as much as it is for others. Hank, on the other hand, tries to be better than other people by acting in their benefit. He's a better swimmer than Khan, at least he believes so for a time, so it's his responsibility to show off. In this case, modesty is an additional virtue to brag about. Although, with Hank Hill, this is so internalized that he genuinely believes the words others perform, especially those of Khan, leading to even more strife between the two. Traffic Jam Hank and Khan back into each other and damage their vehicles, with the only way to prevent an increase in their insurance rates being to attend a defensive driving course. They both enroll in deaf Civ Driving, which turns out to be a comedy show hosted by Roger Buddha Sack, who focuses primarily on racial humor. Hank hates the show, but when Bobby hears about it, he's interested in the routine, so Hank takes his son to the class to try to demotivate him from getting into comedy, only for the plan to backfire when Bobby ends up looking up to Buddha even more. Hank files a complaint against the teacher and gets him fired, but not before the comic invites Bobby to his comedy jam, though this is only after teaching the boy to get more original material, as he's trying to mimic the black comedy, you know, the other kind, of Buddha. Bobby tries to find white experience to make jokes about, and winds up on a white nationalist forum when searching for material. And when he tries performing this in front of a mostly black audience, it's up to Buddha to save the day by distracting the audience with jokes about Hank's butt. Hank and Bobby have a similar approach to comedy in this episode in the sense that both characters fail to understand the why of it. Bobby is able to parrot some funny jokes, but he doesn't understand why the humor works, and ends up creating a shallow impersonation of a comedian, which ends up biting him later when he tries to sell racial comedy to the wrong demographic. Hank, too, doesn't understand why the comedy routine at the class is humorous, but unlike Bobby has a negative predisposition to stand-up, and therefore does not humor the humor. 
Hank gets the comedian fired for racial discrimination in this episode, making an interesting point about the way that offensive humor works. Racial humor is fundamentally offensive to the joke that it's targeting, but it's also humor, and as long as a joke is more funny than it is offensive, people are willing to ignore it and laugh it off like Khan does. But when it crosses that threshold of being more offensive than funny, the joke suddenly becomes a problem. This leads to an issue in the information age where a joke can be recorded and played back again and again, being less funny each time before the only thing remaining is the offensiveness. And so Hank's sense of humor exists as a baseline for what happens to a joke when it's reached its expiration date. Hank's Dirty Laundry Hank and Peggy are out buying a new dryer and try to get a store card with the purchase, only for Hank's application to get declined due to bad credit. He discovers that his credit is poor due to failing to return a series of pornographic videotapes from Arlen Video, but Hank refuses to pay the bills due to his insistence that he never rented them. When he tries to remove the charges, he ends up on a mailing list that sends a large amount of junk, double entendre, mail to his home, earning him the scorn of his neighbors. He starts to lose more friends as he grows increasingly unhinged in his attempts at destroying the evidence and starting a boycott of the video store, until he receives an anonymous package with a hint on how to prove his innocence. Eventually, Hank is able to prove that one of the tapes rented in his name did not exist on the day he rented it, and he's exonerated in small claims. He celebrates the charge being eliminated by purchasing a dryer, which Bobby mistakenly believes is his birthday present, as the whole episode he thought his parents' secrecy was due to planning a surprise birthday party for him a month early. It's interesting, though not unexpected, for Hank to lose all of his friends during this episode as he continuously cracks down on trying to prove his innocence in spite of the contrary evidence. We know that Hank is an honest man, but he's also extremely repressed in everything, and the most repressed people outwardly tend to be the most deviant in secret. This is shown during the episode through Bill's perspective on Hank's habit. He's the most outspoken, while simultaneously being the one with the knowledge of smut to exonerate his friend. There's somewhat of an implication that Bill himself was ordering tapes under Hank's name the entire time. So everybody now believing that they've seen Hank's true nature starts to separate themselves from him as it becomes apparent to them that he's been faking a lot about himself for a while. Even Peggy, who is surprisingly tolerating of Hank when she believes that he's been renting smut behind her back, is more upset that he's lying about it than the actual content of what he's renting. Even then, her concerns are more for Bobby's sake than any moral decency. People are upset at Hank, not because he's looking at porn, but because he tries to take the moral high ground in life and no longer seems to hold that. The Final Shinsult Cotton breaks things off with Dee Dee, who used to work as his chauffeur, so he stays at the Hill residence until he can renew his license, which he thinks he can do as he's memorized the eye chart at the Arlen DMV. But when Hank has the worker switch the chart out, and Cotton learns of this, the veteran becomes upset at his son's betrayal and starts to live with Dale instead. Later on, when Tom Landry Middle School is on a field trip to see the prosthetic leg of General Santa Ana, Dale and Cotton steal it with a plan to negotiate with the Mexican government for a driver's license using the leg as leverage. But this plan doesn't work, and only succeeds in getting him into a psychiatric hospital, where Hank and Peggy are content with leaving him as they're aware that he's become too much of a hassle to keep under control. But Hank feels bad about leaving his father in the sterile environment, and arranges for Dee Dee to return because she wants the Cadillac. One of the major themes expressed throughout King of the Hill is the passing from the old ways into the new, Cotton being an example of the old guard in society. While his service and sacrifice are always viewed with respect, he himself has coasted on this respect his whole life, never doing anything to renew it or maintain his worthiness of the position. This is the general way that the narrative expresses how the changing of societal values ought to pan out. Doing something that's considered inoffensive or normal at the time shouldn't punish you moving into the future, but refusing to update your ideals or change with the trends, assuming the trends are improvements, will eventually make those actions seem less forgivable. Cotton's treatment of Dee Dee was very normal half a century ago, but in the 90s it was no longer acceptable behavior. Cotton's crazy antics likewise would have been the type of thing to be overlooked back when his military service was more recent, an acceptable trait to put up with because of who it was attached to. But that goodwill wears off as the deeds become less of a memory and more of a story. Cotton, like Hank, often fails to adapt to the changing tides of society, though the narrative is much less kind to Cotton purely because he staunchly refuses to, whereas Hank usually comes around.
Leand Saga. Luan's mother, Leanne, gets out of prison and stays at the Hill residence despite Hank's insistence that she avoid the place due to the fact that Luann would have to drop out of beauty school to support her. She stays in Hank's garage for the time being, eventually bonding with Bill when the latter is unable to drink due to a new medication for his foot fungus and Leanne's court order to avoid alcohol. As the two date, Bill starts to spend more and more money on her until he can no longer afford his medication and stops taking it. But when his foot fungus grows back, Leanne starts to sneak alcohol in order to tolerate him. This brings back her old personality as she starts to become more and more abusive, both physically and emotionally, towards Bill. Eventually getting kicked out of Hank's garage where the abuse becomes worse. This comes to a head during a barbecue where she threatens Buckley with a fork, the instrument that she used to stab Luann's father slash Peggy's brother, and Luann tries to stop her. But Peggy comes in to save the day, telling off the woman and eventually kicking her ass. In the end, Luann and Peggy bond together as mother and daughter, that the aunt-niece bond is closer than mother-daughter. Luann's story has always been a story of overcoming adversity due to her upbringing. She was never able to have the healthy, stable childhood that so many other characters got, although as seasons would go on, we learned just how few people's childhood was normal, and so her adulthood is all about the influence of other people around her. Living with Leanne, she probably would have ended up following in her mother's footsteps, but living with the Hill family, her future is much more in her own control. Bill's story also overlaps with Luann's here, as the two of them are both characters emotionally damaged by the lack of certain relationships in their lives. Bill loses Lenore, and Luann loses Leanne. When the latter woman comes to Arlen, she starts to promise to fill a hole in both their hearts, only for it to become apparent why that hole was there in the first place. Luann is desperate to have a maternal figure again, that she's willing to take after a woman who has no interest in her well-being. Bill, too, is desperate to have his house feel less empty, that he's willing to put up with toxicity that takes advantage of his vulnerable emotional state. In the end, that's what the conflicts are about. Vulnerability and the people who can subsist off of it. Junkie Business Hank is put in charge of hiring a new sales associate for Strickland Propane. He considers the qualified Maria Montalvo, but turns her down as he doesn't know how to interact with the woman, instead hiring the presentable Leon Petard. But Leon shows up late and full of excuses, eventually doing less and less work as he spends most of his time strung out or switching between manic and depressive states. Soon, Hank tries to fire him so he can go to rehab, but the next day, Leon returns with a social worker who informs Hank that he cannot fire an addict under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Leon continues demanding more and more accommodations, inspiring the rest of the employees to feign disability so that they can do as little work as him, and eventually Hank decides to quit his job, because this puts Strickland under 15 employees, meaning that they're no longer held to the ADA, and Leon can be fired outright. Hank gets his job back at the end of the episode, and Maria is hired. This episode makes a point about people who misuse government programs for special treatment, making things worse for everybody else, especially the people who really do need to use such programs. It doesn't do this well though, in part because it doesn't represent reality well. It uses an exaggerated version of the ADA that takes liberties on interpretation to make the point about Leon, which inadvertently sells audiences on an idea based off of lies, that circumventing the rules in this way is much more common and more simple than the reality of the situation is, and so it can turn people against helpful legislation due to their misunderstanding. But the episode itself focuses a bit more on Hank's denial of having made a poor hiring decision due to his inherent sexism than it does on the exploitation of the ADA, which only makes up the third act. Ironically enough, Hank discriminates against a qualified employee based on her gender, which is the type of thing that gets him into the mess in the first place. It shows that hiring practices based on old stereotypes exist, and that had he had done the more politically correct thing from the beginning, then he would have had a more competent employee who wouldn't have shut down the whole office, the exact type of situation that these laws were actually meant to prevent in the first place. Life in the Fast Lane, Bobby's Saga when Bobby asks Hank for money, Hank worries that the boy doesn't understand the value of a dollar, and he gets the boy a job at the racetrack to learn a lesson. But Bobby's boss is Jimmy Wichard, a mentally disabled man who makes unreasonable demands of Bobby and forces him to work hard, demeaning jobs. Bobby wants to quit after his first day, but Hank refuses to hear that and gives him platitudes about working 110%, which Bobby takes to heart. 
he gets promoted the next day, though the new position doesn't have any additional pay and has significantly worse work than before. Meanwhile, Hank and co. are supporting Boomhauer in his ambitions to drive the pace car at a NASCAR race, serving as his pit crew while he winds up getting fourth. But while they're at the race hoping for enough crashes that Boomhauer gets sent in, Hank hears from Dale that Jimmy Wichard is insane from having stared at the sun too long. And when Hank sees Bobby about to cross the active racetrack, he confronts his son, learning that Bobby is merely trying to give 110%. Infuriated, Hank jumps the track himself, crossing the fins and making good on his promise to kick the man's ass. By the end of the episode, Bobby still doesn't understand the real value of a dollar, asking his father to go back to the way things were, where he doesn't have to think about cash. It's a lesson he wouldn't have learned under Jimmy the way that anybody wouldn't learn the real value of work if that work is not properly compensated for. Because it's a fact of life that one hour of hard work for some people is less valuable than an hour of easy work for others. If you have a Jimmy Witchard for a boss, then your time and effort ends up getting less than another example used in this episode in Jeff Gordon, who Hank dislikes as he believes that the man's had everything handed to him. But despite that, one hour of driving from Gordon earns a lot more than Hank gets from an hour of propane sales, which will then earn more than Bobby gets from an hour of climbing stairs in the hot sun. And while to Hank there's an idea that simply keeping your nose down and working hard will eventually result in climbing the ladder, this aspect of the American dream does not exist for some people who have bosses like Wichards, or any disconnected boss for that matter. Even Hank himself repeatedly grows disillusioned with Buck Strickland, but is too blinded by his loyalty to the concept of capitalism to realize that he's being exploited by it. In a fair world, Hank Hill would be a multi-millionaire purely because of his work ethic. Peggy's Turtle Song When Bobby gets diagnosed with ADD at school due to having too much sugar with his breakfast, Peggy starts to feel concerned that he's not getting enough attention. So he gets put on some medication while Peggy quits substitute teaching to stay at home full time. Hank is happy about this at first, but Peggy can't stand being cooped up all day and eventually starts to take guitar lessons to get out of the house. Her guitar teacher encourages her to write and later perform a song during a Mother's Day show, which Hank tries to stop her from doing, as he wants a more traditional Mother's Day celebration. But when he calls his mother and she tells him about how boring and unfulfilling her life was as a stay-at-home mother, he realizes why Peggy was so intent on leaving. Peggy performs on stage that evening, and Hank stops by to drop off Betsy, his guitar, encouraging Peggy not to sing a song about a depressed turtle, but one who finds fulfillment with a turtle named Hank. Meanwhile, Bobby stops taking his medication because of the side effects and gives a pill to Luann to focus on her beauty school exam. But when the Hills see the extreme effect it has on her, decide that maybe Bobby doesn't need the medication after all. Peggy's plot in this episode shows how restrictive her life is without her career, that the button-down life as a housewife isn't for her, and that this old-fashioned idea of what a woman ought to be is no longer the kind of thing that modern woman can find happiness from. But Hank worries that she's taking it too far, that spending time around alternative women is going to corrupt her and have her mentality drift too far away from a tradition that's been around his whole life. It's not until he realizes that his own mother was not happy or content as a homemaker that Hank's mind is finally changed, that just because an idea is traditional doesn't mean that it's good. He wants to support his wife, he just doesn't have the right idea of what it is that she wants or needs. The B-plot of this episode also touches on the overprescription of ADD medications that's been going on for years. As of making this video, there are ongoing shortages, which hurts the people who really need the assistance, or who have valid issues mentally. But even in the 90s, there was an issue of overprescription that benefited every party making the decision except the kids themselves. For the school, they're just trying to make a population that's more manageable, and the parents accept the diagnosis as a means to escape culpability for their child's actions. It's not raising your child wrong if they have a disability. This ends up hurting the credibility of legitimate diagnoses and cheapening the actual disorder, all while diverting resources away from where they actually ought to be. Propane Boom Megalomart begins to sell propane, which puts pressure on Strickland, eventually resulting in the small business shutting down as they can't compete. Hank is put out of a job for a while, searching fruitlessly for work and other sales. Meanwhile, Luann is kicked out of beauty school for missing a tuition payment, and she starts to look for a job to raise the tuition money. She starts studying to get a job working for Buckley in Megalomart's propane department, but Hank swallows his pride, giving up his crusade against the store, and takes the job before she can get it. 
The two feud over this for a while, with Hank getting repeatedly disrespected at his new job, while Luann tries to get some sort of revenge, eventually settling on breaking up with Buckley at a Chuck Mangione concert held at the store. But Hank has plans for the concert as well, to wave a defaming banner and disrupt the performance with kazoos and air horns. But before he can start the distraction, a gas leak caused by an improperly handled propane tank causes an explosion, and the episode ends with several characters unaccounted for. This episode concludes the second season with a cliffhanger, leaving a few characters' whereabouts unknown, but it's obvious that a character like Hank wouldn't be killed off, and the family dynamic with Luann is still worth exploring enough that audiences should know she's safe as well. It goes to show that when the cast of a show is strong enough, certain traits of its writing can remain intact purely out of the writers doing whatever is the most interesting. Luann still has stories to tell, so she's going to be safe. But what this episode is also about is something that's been built up throughout the second season. Hank's dislike of large chain stores like Mega Lomart has been a staple of his character since the first episode, and several season 2 episodes have also alluded to the damage that these stores can do to the fabric of a small town community. They lower prices using economy of scale, then once their local competition's driven out, the prices get jacked up to higher, with no one able to fight back against the monopoly. It's a staple of a capitalist economy that everyone is in constant competition with one another, and a dollar cannot be earned without somebody else losing it. And yet, despite traditional conservative values and capitalism going so closely together, the inevitable endpoint of an economy based on capital is to eventually scrub these small town values out to replace them with the cold, corporate aesthetic. Season 3 Season 3 marked a change in staffing as Mike Judge stepped down as showrunner to focus on production, replaced by Richard Appel, who worked alongside series veteran Greg Daniels. As Daniels had always been at the heart of the characterization of the cast, this change marked a shift in the way that Season 3 approached episodes. Fewer episodes focused on some modern aspect of culture or politics, confronting the family through a newly introduced side character, and the focus was shifted instead towards plots about the main cast. So new locations, characters, and events occur less out of a desire to make commentary on that aspect of the real world, and more out of a desire to explore the reactions of the cast to these challenges and obstacles. Whether their preconceived notions of how things ought to be can stand up against reality, or if they have to undergo a personal arc. It's not to say that the episodes with more populist bins are altogether gone, only that the cast is becoming developed enough that these aren't the only ways to approach a new plotline. It's not solely that the change in showrunners caused this shift, but that the development of the characters enabled the shift to happen in the first place. But this was really the appeal of the show from the beginning. King of the Hill had a strong cast grounded in realism, and because we could relate to and understand these characters, and we could relate to their problems, the entire show was able to come across as so much more realistic than other shows on the air at the time. And with realism comes even more relatability, the two supporting each other. So the cast starts to feel like real people not only in how they're presented, but in how we think about their actions and reactions. Death of a Propane Salesman The episode picks up following the previous episode's cliffhanger ending. Firefighters are going through the rubble and they find Hank and Luann, as well as Chuck Mangione but Luann's hair did not survive the explosion. Hank isn't processing the explosion very well, turning down an opportunity to go back to work, or even to grill, and Peggy assumes that he's developed a fear of propane. Luann isn't processing the death of Buckley well either, using her lack of hair as a reason to make bold political statements. But when she finds a birthday card Buckley gave her, she finally begins to grieve, getting over it by talking to herself with the manger babies. Hank, meanwhile, learns from a grief counselor that his fear of propane is just a projection of his fear of death. And when trying to discuss this with the alley, Bobby overhears the conversation and fears for his father's well-being, running away from home. Hank tracks down his son and repeats a Buddhist story with his own twist, finally internalizing the message and accepting what happened. Khan tells a story about a man hanging from a branch, faced with the inevitability of death, deciding to enjoy a strawberry instead of dwelling on his own doom. It's considered a joke by the funeral goers, who fail to comprehend why the story is relevant, as they themselves are the type to think about the tigers. Hank has always tried to live the life he's expected to live, rather than doing what he wants to do. He views momentary pleasures as a waste of time and money, and this is ultimately why he ends up shutting down at the thought of his own death. If Hank simply works himself into the grave, then what was any of it for? 
The previous episode asked how small town values can coexist with capitalist systems if those systems profit by dismantling the low profit, simple lives that characters like Hank idealize. And here, Hank has to consider the opposite end of this question. If he merely focuses on doing things the right way for his entire life, then it's not really his life. He merely exists as a result of generations of peer pressure, with a larger focus on fitting into a mold than being Hank Hill. The small moments in life, whether it's a strawberry growing out of a cliff or grilling a steak on a Sunday, are the real reason to keep on living. This episode ends on Hank sharing a moment with Bobby, who misunderstands the lesson on death his father was trying to teach him, but far from trying to force a lesson, he simply enjoys a little moment. And they call it Bobby Love. Bobby meets a girl at his school named Marie, who's smitten with his sense of humor. She invites him out a few times, and they even kiss in the alleyway. Bobby brags about his new relationship to his parents, but when they disapprove, Hank as she's a vegetarian and Peggy because she's two years older than him, he says they're only jealous, as Hank and Peggy never outwardly express their love. But when Bobby sees Marie dancing with other guys at a party, he starts to get jealous and possessive, with Marie telling him that they're not dating and that she didn't consider their relationship that kind of one. Bobby sulks over the breakup for a while, crying around the house until his parents take him out for a steak dinner. But when he sees Marie there, Bobby decides to order a 72-ounce steak, rare, and eat it in front of the entire restaurant as a sign that he's moved on. Meanwhile, Khan drops off his old couch in the alley and the gang touch it up, getting attached to it until it disappears one day, taken to Bill's house. Due to his lack of experience with romance, Bobby is unable to parse the type of relationship he has with Marie, her free-loving attitude, reminiscent of countercultural movements from the late 60s, coming across as confusing to him, as what's considered friendship to her is considered romance to him. He misconstrues her affection for a deeper love, and he ends up heartbroken because of it. But it's not as though Bobby is completely to blame for this misunderstanding, as Marie's personality is viewed as far too, we'll say, extroverted to be normal. It's really just the optics of Marie's relationship to Bobby, the outward things, that are misrepresentative. The deeper aspects of their togetherness are not shared. While Marie might be okay with kissing Bobby, she's not close enough to compromise on her ideals for the guy, at least not in the same way that Hank and Peggy have adapted to each other's habits together. Bobby thinks that he's close enough with Marie to adopt her vegetarian ways, but Marie isn't willing to compromise with Bobby or adapt to his wants out of anything more than obligation. In the end, this was the real pronouncement of closeness that Hank and Peggy had that was lacking in the puppy love relationship of their son. Peggy's Headache When Peggy's favorite newspaper columnist retires, she considers sending in a sample script to apply for the job, but all the pressure to hit the deadline starts to give her a headache, and she goes to John Redcorn for a massage. This massage works, but Hank is terrified of his wife visiting the man as Nancy is cheating on Dale with the guy, a relationship that started when he started treating her headaches. Hank tries to explain his reservations to Peggy, and only then does she realize the infidelity. Soon, she starts to freak out around the couple, unsure how to maintain the lie going on under their noses, and Peggy uses her job writing for the column to announce that she's going to tell the truth. But before she gets the chance to say it, Joseph comes over and his interactions with Dale cause her to realize that, while Dale's not the boy's father, he's still his dad, and she decides against breaking the illusion. A popular fan theory for King of the Hill is the idea that Dale Gribble is aware of his wife's infidelity and doesn't bother to say or do anything about it, either because he wants what's best for his son, or he just wants his wife to be happy, or he enjoys the fact that he can taunt John Redcorn by raising his son in front of him. But this theory goes strongly against a core part of Dale's character, that despite being a conspiracy theorist primed to believe anything, he's totally unaware of the actual secret going on in his own house. Without this dramatic irony, there's much less appeal to his character, and it sells short much of the comedy behind who he is. Peggy in this episode also struggles with maintaining sanity upon learning about the infidelity going on under her nose, the idea that there's a great big lie no one's bothering to say anything about. And we can tell a lot about the mentality of other characters on Rainy Street by the way that they treat this issue. Many of them simply try to avoid bringing it up to prevent an awkward conversation. They prefer to let sleeping dogs lie, as it's unlikely that mentioning the affair will actually do anything to prevent it, possibly even making the situation worse as tempers could rise, and it's none of their business. 
In the end, it's nobody's business because they don't bother to make it their business. And this outcome, no matter your opinions on it, is what everyone believes is best for them, so why complain? Pregnant Pause Ladybird is in heat, and Hank tries to set her up with a stud as he's concerned that there may not be time for her to have puppies of her own. But when he finds out that she has a narrow uterus, mirroring Hank's narrow urethra, he grows concerned that she may never know motherhood. So he begins to research new ways to improve fertility, which reminds Peggy of her own attempts at having a child, and she grows resentful of the extra care Ladybird is getting that she never received. Meanwhile, Dale takes a four-hour bounty hunting course so that he can hunt humans, but when his first target has a house in the woods surrounded by guard dogs that he can't get past, Dale borrows Ladybird to use her hormones to distract the hounds while he goes inside. Hank and Peggy race to rescue their dog, but Peggy confronts Hank over the special treatment that his hound is getting over her. Then Hank admits the reason he never took the extra steps before. There's no romance in that. And he recalls how adopting Ladybird is what re-sparked the romance in their relationship in the first place. Hank and Peggy in this episode end up making the decision to have another child together, something that Hank wanted but didn't bring up, so he uses Ladybird's potential puppy as a surrogate for this desire, and something that Peggy herself doesn't bring up either, as she assumed Hank was more interested in his dog than in her. The entire episode is based on the two not communicating properly with each other, their passive goals and actions doing more to drive them apart than together. But with a little bit of prodding, they're finally able to admit a few of the things that went without saying as a re-pronouncement of their love, that Ladybird was a symbol of their relationship, just like Bobby. It's an interesting dynamic in that usually a couple having a child together to fix their marriage is viewed as a sign of toxicity, that they're dooming a child to be raised by a loveless marriage, and thus dooming them to become emotionally stunted. But it's not as though Hank and Peggy don't love each other, they're just poor at expressing this. And so, it wasn't that the child slash dog came first and the love came after, but that the love came first and they were able to conceive Bobby because they found it again. Next of Shin Following up on the previous episode, Hank and Peggy are trying for a baby, but due to Hank's low sperm count, they're unable to conceive again. While Hank is trying various methods to increase his count, Cotton makes an unannounced visit alongside Dee Dee, who is visibly pregnant. But while out shopping for baby supplies, Cotton begins to feel the pressure of being a parent, and runs off with Bobby where he tells the boy about his parents trying to conceive, before running off to Vegas. Bobby fears that he's being replaced, as if he wasn't good enough, or that he'd be viewed worse with more competition. Though when he's put in charge of the house while Hank leaves to track down his father, Bobby feels validated as useful again. After a search, Hank finds his father gambling and tells him that he's given up on having a child, which Cotton insults him for as he believes Hank would make a good father again. He eventually decides to come back, but not before the two get the chance to bond in Vegas together. Hank and Cotton have their differences put on display during this episode, which each of their stories paralleling in their opposites. Hank and Peggy would make good parents, Cotton would not, did not. Hank and Peggy are trying to have a child, Cotton and Dee Dee had one by accident. And while Hank is eager for the chance to be around children, Cotton balks at the thought of being a father again. But these opposites are things recognized by the characters. When Hank announces he's giving up on having another child, Cotton tells him off, knowing that Hank isn't like him and that he shouldn't try to feel the same way. Another way that this is shown is how in other characters react to potential changes to the dynamic. Bobby fears that he might be replaced by a hypothetical new Hill family member, and so he begins to work harder to take an interest in Hank's life and prove himself useful around the house. But Hank never worries that Cotton is trying to replace him, as he knows from the outset that he doesn't have to worry about competition. In part, this is because he's long since given up on trying to win his father's approval, knowing how little that's worth. But because he's already had the time to prove himself to his father, only to get nothing in return. Hank doesn't fear losing a love that he doesn't have, but Bobby, knowing that his parents love and respect him, has some anxiety at potentially losing that. Peggy's Pageant Fever Peggy gets the idea in her head to enter the Mrs. Heimlich County Beauty Pageant, with the grand prize being a new truck. But as she's meeting the other participants, she realizes how hopelessly outclassed she is, not just in terms of looks, but in terms of accolades and accomplishments. So she gets funding from Buck Strickland, who thought he was sponsoring Luann, to get a complete makeover. 
but when Luann messes up her highlights and gets replaced, and her attempts to bribe Nancy Gribble, one of the judges, do not succeed, Peggy starts to fear for her chances. She gets a complete makeover to the point of being unrecognizable, even going so far as to tape up her feet and ass. But when the contest is about to start, Hank, being realistic about the situation, arrives to sweep her off her feet in a new truck, which is really just his old one with a new paint job. Peggy has never valued her self-worth by her physical beauty, largely out of an acceptance that she won't be able to compete, masked as a trust in her other abilities. She's supremely confident in everything that she does, even if that confidence is misplaced, and usually that level of confidence is all that really is needed to make a passing effort at things. It's nerve-wracking to teach a classroom full of children, but Peggy considers herself the best at it, and that confidence is what gives her the necessary air of authority. But when she starts to go up against a woman outside of her caliber, it's a reality check for her abilities that makes her confidence in herself as a woman falter. But the purpose of confidence is less about your own abilities and more about the perception of those abilities to others and yourself. It's completely possible to fake your way through a situation for a short period of time, but it's much harder to fake a long-term commitment, such as a marriage. In the end, it's Hank's judgment of Peggy that matters more than any panel of pageant judges, as he's the one who's on the receiving end of Peggy for the majority of the time. As long as the people who are closest to you find you to be a worthy person, that's all that really matters. Nine Pretty Darn Angry Men Hank invites his friends to a lawnmower focus group the day after Thanksgiving, a holiday that Cotton ruins by showing up unannounced and trash-talking everything from the food to Hank's mother. The next day, the group goes to the mall. Peggy plans on doing all of her shopping as early as possible, but due to staying up the whole night clipping coupons, she falls asleep while having her shoe repaired. Bobby and Luann go ice skating, so Luann can get back into the dating pool, her reservations disappearing when she sees the ghost of Buckley. Tilly and Dee Dee lament how little Hank stands up to his father until they walk in on the focus group. There, Hank is trying to defend his old model of mower against the new one, which, despite having many more features, isn't actually an improvement on the tried and true version. He has to convince the other focus group members one by one that the features they adore are actually negatives, until getting to Cotton, who only dislikes the mower because Hank likes it. He ends up telling off his father in front of Tilly, and Cotton storms out, with the family returning home later, minus the still-sleeping Peggy. It's not subtext in this episode that Hank views his lawnmower the same way he views his birth mother, reliable and not worth getting rid of for something newer just because you can. To Hank, the idea of getting rid of something that works is abhorrent and a symptom of a person who can't recognize the good things in their life and therefore, who doesn't deserve them, as Hank thinks that anything you earn will be something that you also appreciate. Discarding Tilly like she's an object is a bit like saying that he didn't earn the right to be with her, and that Cotton's the one who should have been dumped instead of the other way around. There would be a more unfortunate connotation to this episode's message derived from Hank treating his mother like a lawnmower and Tilly like the new model, the idea that he's treating women like objects at all instead of people, but it's avoided by the fact that Hank Hill really does love his mower. It's not so much that he's treating people like objects, but that he's treating objects like people. This is put into contrast with Cotton, who does the same connotation but flipped, in the sense that he views everybody as an object, even the people close to him. Hank only exists to embarrass him, Dale and Bobby are only valuable when they agree with him, and relationships with other people are all about whatever it is he personally stands to gain. Good Hill Hunting It's hunting season, and everybody on the block is taking their kids out to kill a deer, viewing it as a rite of passage. But Hank hesitates on buying the hunting permits as he's afraid of spending two days in the woods alone with Bobby, not knowing what they could talk about out there. Peggy convinces him to go out and get the permits, though, as she doesn't want Bobby to fail at his rite of passage and stay as a boy forever. But due to his hesitation, Hank ends up not being able to get a permit for the boy, and he has to shut down Bobby's dreams. But seeing how much Bobby wanted to hunt, he finds a resort, La Grunta, where all of the amenities are taken care of for you. Yet while the two are out hunting together, Bobby begins to realize that it's not the same, and he refrains from shooting a deer. Later on the ride home, Bobby is optimistic that he'll be able to spend another year learning how to be a man from his father, so Hank decides that he can drive his truck for a while. And then Bobby runs over a deer, giving the episode a happy ending. 
The idea of killing for sport as a rite of passage is, despite what this episode brings up, not as much of a historical rite as it pretends that it is. Much in the same way that lawns and trucks and the like are recent inventions, hunting is a cultural invention of recent decades that merely borrows the set dressing of being an ancient and storied passage among early humans to make itself seem like anything other than an excuse for middle-class office workers to get out of the house. But traditions and rites like this are never actually about how long-standing they are or, or how many generations have upheld the belief. They're social tools, things meant to make a person feel a sense of belonging into a group. And that's the way that Bobby sees it. The way that hunting is viewed by the narrative is a different thing, though. I've reviewed Moral Oral and The Simpsons episodes based on this concept of hunting that viewed it as a misappropriated form of toughening up a boy into a man. But King of the Hill is a show that doesn't portray hunting as a wicked thing to do, or some sort of masculinity substitute. Rather, it's a bonding activity between a father and his child. The narrative still paints it as an excuse for the real development, which is something that's earned when Hank gets over his awkwardness around the boy, and the two are finally able to get along at La Grunta. Killing the deer at the end of the episode is just a way of tying everything together. Pretty Pretty Dresses It's Christmas time, or the anniversary of the day that Lenore left Bill. He's sulking, much more than usual, ruining multiple dinners with the Hill family by bringing up old lost loves and bringing in an iguana, until he's eventually kicked out. But after he tries to jump off the roof of his house, the rest of the alley has to make time to watch over him, which winds up being solely Hank's responsibility. Eventually, Hank snaps from the constant exhaustion of watching his friend, and he tells the guy off, screaming that Lenore is gone and she's never coming back. Hank fears that he was too harsh, but Bill seems to accept the answer, until Hank discovers Bill dressed in Lenore's old clothes, pretending to be her. He tries living his life as his ex-wife for a while and eventually shows up to Hank's Christmas party in the dress. The partygoers start to admonish Bill before Hank comes out in one of Peggy's dresses to lure Bill away from the public. Then, pretending to be Lenore, he tells off Bill for good. And Bill responds by saying that he deserved better. Once he snapped out of it, Bill realizes that he hit rock bottom, which means it's all uphill from there. Bill was never able to get any sense of closure from his relationship with Lenore, the woman walking out on him without so much as a goodbye. Over the years, he's become obsessed with the woman, or rather, he's become obsessed with the idea of Lenore. Because from everything we've heard about her up to this point, including an appearance by the woman herself in a later season, she's not at all the type of person characterized by Bill's impression of her at the third act of the episode. The fact that Hank was able to convince Bill's damaged mind that he himself was Lenore is only further proof of the fact that he more or less does not remember the woman at all. This episode ends up putting more context into the toxicity that Bill puts up with, not only from the woman in his life such as Leanne back in season 2, or Lenore through their marriage, but from his friends as well. Bill is such a pushover that he's willing to put up with constant verbal abuse from his friends, and that's what he accepts from the people who like him, or at least do tolerate him. His mental state is so thoroughly tied to the people that he becomes dependent on that he cannot consider himself as a person worthy of his own company, trying to slam his head in a drawer or inhale the fumes from an electric oven. But by getting rid of the Lenore-shaped hole in his heart, he's finally able to let his own mind take over his psyche. A firefighting we will go. The episode starts with Hank, Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer being interrogated for something major. It then flashes back to days earlier, where the guys are told about a firefighter strike that necessitates more volunteers. They take the position, but it's clear that nobody knows what they're doing as they argue and fight with one another. The oldest firefighter in Arlen, Chet Elderson, passes away, and they argue even further after botching his funeral. Finally, they're called to their first real emergency, which was taken care of without them, and when they return, they find that the firehouse burnt to the ground. Each man offers a different account of events, with Boomhauer's tanning bed, Dale's cigarette, and Bill's toaster oven all being prime suspects. But when it's Hank's turn to tell his story, he realizes that it was Chet Elderson's favorite sign being left plugged in that did it, and after realizing that his friends still respected him despite their arguments, he blames the dead man, and they're all let go. From everything we've seen up to this point, it's a wonder why the men of Rainy Street even bothered to spend time together at all if they're constantly at each other's throats. Boomhauer seems to have the most life outside of his friend circle with an active social life without them. Bill, we saw last episode, mostly spends time around whoever tolerates him. Hank mostly seems to hang out with the guys because of inertia. He knew them in high school and doesn't like to shake things up. 
and Dale considers his friends as stupid for not knowing the same conspiracies he does. It's a wonder why any of the men hang out together in the first place, and how they'd all end up owning houses on the same street as adults. But their group dynamic is more of a writer's tool than anything else. Having four clashing temperaments for your main characters allows a variety of reactions to different scenarios. The writers can pick and choose who they wish to include in a plot based on who has something to contribute to said plot. It's the reason why Boomhauer gets the least development, because he doesn't talk enough for any more than a single punchline to occur, and thus doesn't get brought along as often. And of course, Dale, being the most outspoken of the group, ends up having the most plot involvement of anybody of the side cast. To spank with love. Peggy is substitute teaching Spanish for a week, but when she struggles to get a misbehaving student, Dooley, under control, and gets a needs improvement on her evaluation, she begins to feel stressed, peaking when Dooley pants her during class, which she reacts to by spanking the kid. Despite the child's parents being understanding of the situation, she gets fired anyway, and she spends a while sulking until Cotton hears of the reason that she was fired. He gets some of his buddies from the Arlen VFW to rally together, including Hank's old principal, who disciplined thousands of students in his day, and they give her the old paddle and her job back. For the next few days, she's known as Paddle and Peggy by the students, ruling through fear and keeping students in order with threats. But she starts to learn that students, including her own son, are afraid of her, culminating in Peggy panicking when her paddle is thrown out and discovered in the Gribble family's garbage. She accuses Joseph and threatens to beat him, but when Dale confesses and she realizes what she's becoming, Peggy decides to drop the Paddle and Peggy persona, instead keeping students in line by making her lessons more entertaining. In the original script for this episode, the school board praised Peggy for spanking Dooley, promoting her teaching ideals as something others ought to look up to, as she began to discipline students more and more frequently. But this was rewritten, following the table read, to make the district less supportive and for Peggy to lose her job instead. The version of the story we got was one much closer to the typical themes of King of the Hill. It's the veterans and the older folks who support Peggy while the kids think it's abhorrent and the adults are caught in the middle. Hank and co. are outwardly supportive, but largely as a means of justifying their own punishment, instead of coming across as though they were complaining. But both episodes kept one thing consistent. Peggy herself is the one who becomes disgusted at the person she's become, obsessed with violence as a part of her self-image, rather than any actual disciplinary benefit that corporal punishment could have. If a child is too young to understand reason, then they won't understand why they're being struck. If they're old enough to understand reason, then you should try reason first. Peggy has a view of herself as a good substitute teacher, and she believes that spanking is a final resort, after every other option is tried, so for her to have built an identity around a last resort is to build an identity around failure. Three Coaches and a Bobby Bobby's football team, the Cougars, is repeatedly losing games to other teams, and the parents try to give some advice to the coach, who quits. Reminiscing on their high school football days, the Alley decide to get their old football coach, Sowers, out of retirement to whip the Cougars into shape. He takes the job and begins running drills on the kids, many of whom leave to join The Wind, Arlen's youth soccer team. This includes Joseph, their best player, and Bobby. Eventually, Hank comes across a practice where Sowers is trying to run over the kids with his car, and he realizes the old man is insane, so he tells the guy off and takes over. But as the Cougars have lost so many players, they're still losing games, until Bobby, now disillusioned with soccer, convinces all his old friends to return to their old sport. Meanwhile, Peggy tries to fit in with the soccer moms, but can't stand their company, so she quits and returns to rooting for the football team. No matter how good a coach is, he's worthless without a good team to back him up. No matter how good a team is, they still need a good coach to guide them in the right direction. And there are so many other factors that also go into deciding the quality of a team that to give the credit to one source is a misattribution. But Hank and his friends equate the quality of their high school sports careers to Coach Sowers, largely because he was the loudest person to try to take credit. Naturally, because one person does not make a team, one person cannot also fix a team, a lesson that Hanks learns harshly in this episode when he realizes that Sowers has lost his mind, assuming that he had it in the first place. Hank wants to go back to the way things were without understanding why things were that way, and an aspect of this desire is to avoid the way things are becoming. He hates soccer as it's too new wave and represents the opposite of his high school days, where coaches were more physically abusive to their players when they weren't verbally abusing them, as the soccer coach is focusing more on supporting his athletes and keeping a good vibe. 
but in the end, Hank recognizes that reclaiming the good old days doesn't mean emulating parts of them without context, but instead trying to recapture the feeling through other means. Ultimately, Bobby is happier on a losing team because Hank found a way to capture that feeling. Deconstructing Henry Khan is trying to brag to an unimpressed Hank, so to prove that his new job is better, he takes the guy to his office under the guise of trying to buy propane and shows off a new top-secret government contract. But when Hank tells Bill, and Bill tells a general, Khan gets fired, and he takes it out on Hank and his neighbors. He refuses to accept reality as he constantly acts better than everybody at his new job, which gets him fired again, and soon Hank is guilted by Peggy into trying to help out at the Sufanusen phone residence. Hank begins to do all the things that Khan used to do while the guy is absent, nowhere to be seen, which causes Peggy to start growing resentful that her husband is being spoiled by another woman. Eventually, Hank finds Khan's car and sees the guy living in a restaurant's bathroom, where he opens up about the high expectations on his shoulders. In the end, Khan arrives back home with a new job, waking up the whole neighborhood to brag about it. It's revealed in this episode that Khan and Min have been living paycheck to paycheck, that despite having so many nicer things than all their neighbors, they don't actually have any more wealth than the others. For Khan, his pursuit of work and wealth is about prestige. To follow the American dream as an immigrant is to win at capitalism, to try and get as much money as possible, to not only look better than everyone else, but to be better. The idea that a person's worth is equal to their net worth. So to have a lot of nice things means that he's winning compared to all of his neighbors, who are losers because they value things other than money. At the end of the episode, Khan tries to get his family to move to Houston with him, but Min refuses to go with him as she's become attached to the neighbors. This is something that, despite his complaints, Khan still accepts as he too has realized that his neighborhood has some intrinsic value. The Sufa Nusen phones were driven out of every other community they lived in prior to Arlen due to Khan's personality. But the fact that he's willing to put up with Hank and Co. means that he's starting to come around on the idea of neighbors being a priceless commodity, even if he won't yet admit that. The Wedding of Bobby Hill Bobby is put in charge of watching Boomhauer's house while he's away meeting a woman he met online. Luann meets a new guy, Rad the Badeix, who is a self-proclaimed genius. He dates Luann for a while until he learns that Bobby is house-sitting and then throws a party in the vacant home. When Luann realizes she's being taken advantage of, she breaks up with Rad and calls Hank over to kick out the party-goers, admonishing Bobby for his irresponsibility. Bobby and Luann each blame the other for their situation, and they begin a prank war, which culminates in Bobby swapping out Luann's birth control. When Hank and Peggy find out about this, they decide to teach Bobby a lesson by telling him he's caused his cousin to become pregnant, and they throw a fake shotgun wedding between the two, with Luann in on the prank. At least, mostly, as they tell Luann that Bill was a real ordained minister, and that the wedding actually happened. Both kids are distraught for a while until Bill finally lets the secret out, and Bobby and Luann go back to being unmarried, telling the other about all the pranks still out there. Bobby still recognizes that he's a child and also still has a ways to go, insofar as growing up. This is in part why he's so eager to consistently take after characters like Rad. He views the other guy as being mature, and therefore latches onto him as a role model. But this acknowledgement is also why he's so nervous about the fake wedding to Luann. He's still a kid, a kid who wants to be an adult, but he knows that he's still far from that point, and so the responsibilities of being an adult terrify him as much as the privileges thrill him. But Hank and Peggy know all too well how much freedom is sacrificed for the sake of getting things done. When you're an adult, you can do whatever you want to, but part of that maturity is knowing better. Unfortunately, you're bound to make several mistakes in life when those two aspects aren't growing in tandem, like Luann dating Rad. She's old enough to have that freedom, but it hasn't quite caught up to her that she needs to self-regulate. There's a bit of a missed opportunity here to show Hank and Peggy faulting on the other side of caution, to have bound themselves with so much responsibility that they no longer know how to enjoy that freedom, but the episode was already pretty packed, and so it never got said. Slight of Hank Hank and Peggy are arguing over the paint in Bobby's room, specifically that it has clouds and Hank believes the boy is too old for them. 
Later, they're taken to a magic show as a part of Nancy Gribble's birthday party, and Hank is unimpressed with the magician's act, although Peggy loves it, especially when she's called onto the stage to participate in one of the tricks. Hank becomes obsessed with a trick involving a pinata that Peggy was a part of, trying and failing to reconstruct the set to learn how it could have been done. Later on, he goes back to the magic show to try and use Luann as a plant so she can reveal it to him, and takes Bobby along to ruin magic for him in the process. But between Hank and Peggy's discussion on the trick, Bobby starts to take a greater interest in magic and does a Sunday school performance, likening Jesus to a magician that does not go over well. On the way back from church, the two are arguing over who influenced Bobby to behave that way, and he starts to worry that he caused his parents to hate each other. His attempts at getting them back together only ramp up the argument, which turns into a kicking each other in the shins match, somehow ending the argument. The end of this episode teaches the lesson that some things just aren't meant to be understood logically. Occasionally, you have to accept the results at face value and have a bit of faith in how they got there, enjoying the experience instead of trying to understand it. Hank and Peggy argue over their differing senses of creativity, and they both learn this lesson in a roundabout way. It's not that Hank understands Peggy, or vice versa, it's that they appreciate each other in spite of this, likening their relationship to the magic trick from earlier. But Bobby ends up not understanding his parents, trying to apply logic from Joseph to get them back together and having the plan backfire. Because he's not a part of the relationship, he doesn't have the out of appreciating it. So from an outsider's perspective, it appears that they may have ended up divorcing over the disagreement, as he's not privy to the hundreds of little reasons why that doesn't make sense. And this is also why he doesn't understand why they got back together. He wasn't there to see it happen, and even if he was, it wouldn't make sense to him due to lacking information. Also, the trick is explained at the end of the episode as a trapdoor behind the pinata. When rewinding the episode, you can even see Peggy leaving backstage dressed as an assistant. John Vitti presents Return to La Grunta. Tired of always having to lend her money, Hank gets Luann a job as the drink girl at La Grunta's golf course. Once she has money of her own to spend, she decides to pay Hank back by giving him a gift certificate to go swimming with Duke the Dolphin. Hank enjoys the swim for a while, until Duke turns on him, dragging him underwater where Hank is sexually assaulted by the creature. The hotel pays him off with a series of gifts, and he and Luann agree never to speak about it. But later, Luann gets groped while working on the golf course, and mimicking Hank's behavior, she decides to start dressing in baggy clothes and keeping what happened to herself. Realizing the bad influence he's had on her, Hank decides to come clean about the incident, telling Peggy and the alley about it. He takes all the gifts the hotel gave to him back, refusing to accept being silenced. And while he's there, sees Luann getting harassed again, and grabs the guy doing the harassment, throwing him in the pool with Duke, who then assaults him. A lot of Hank's conservative ideology is about trying to keep things the way they are by not rocking the boat, so to speak. There's an idea that things are good, so any potential change is more likely to make things worse than better. But this is only true when the current state of society is good. For a woman like Luann, getting sexually harassed while working or living was a common part of life in the mid-20th century and before. But this, of course, was not true for people like Hank. If you were a straight, white, middle-class man, then a lot of problems that others faced simply did not apply to you. So the Hank Hills of the world often refuse to acknowledge or empathize with why others would complain. After all, they themselves were doing fine. But here, Hank gets to experience firsthand what it's like when someone is assaulted by a person, or dolphin, with enough of a position of influence that the incident would be covered up. La Grunta doesn't want to lose its dolphin exhibit, so they're willing to hide the incident involving Hank, and seeing him become complicit with this for his own sake is what encourages Luann to mimic the behavior. She might risk losing her job if she complains to the wrong person, and if there's a stigma at all around victimhood, then she can lose a lot more as well. It takes Hank deciding not to be ashamed to finally encourage a ripple effect that finally results in the sexual deviant dolphin getting taken away. Escape from Party Island Hank's mother Tilly and a group of her friends are on their way to Port Aransas to view a museum of miniatures. But Hank is concerned about his mother driving and volunteers to take the woman himself. They arrive in the city despite the woman complaining about Hank the whole time, and he's bored as they all look in awe at the various miniatures. But later that evening, groups of college kids start to arrive and Hank realizes that they're there during spring break, with the all-night partying turning the island into chaos. 
He tries to keep the woman insulated from the party goers and eventually demands that they all leave, having to fight his way through the college students to get them all corralled into one place. But while searching for his mother, he learns from Lyle Neff, who makes most of the miniatures, how often older women use the glass crafts as an escape from their lives, a lesson that applies to Tilly as well. He buys her a model of the LA airport as an apology, and the group leaves the island before it's completely overrun by partying. Back in Arlen, Bill is convinced that Hank has left Peggy, and tries to woo her, only for Peggy to tell him off and eventually push him off the bleachers at a Little League game. Hank goes unappreciated in this episode for everything that he does to protect the old woman from the partygoers during spring break, and in the same vein, he underappreciates the value that the miniatures gave to Tilly back when she was trying to put up with Cotton's antics. Cotton and a bunch of drunk college students being equated in this episode. This is why, after racing across the island to try to find his mother while she is searching for her unicorn, he doesn't end up telling her off for putting herself in danger. To Tilly, the greater danger exists from having to confront the decades of abuse that Cotton put her through than to have to put up with the inherent danger posed by copious consumption of alcohol on the island. Hank doesn't manage to get all of the women to cooperate with leaving the island until he starts to act firmly with them, which doesn't win him any popularity with the group, but that's not the point. This is also reflected in the Peggy and Bill plotline, as Peggy is firm in her rejection of Bill from the beginning, a rejection that he refuses to accept. Bill projects his own insecurities onto Peggy and Hank's relationship, and believes that it's doomed to the same end as his own, partially why he doesn't accept it when Peggy says no. But there's a bit more respect given from Tilly's friends when Hank rejects their pleas to spend more time on the island, even if they don't show it quite so outwardly. Love hurts, and so does art. Bobby falls in love with a New York-style deli and begins sneaking out to eat there regularly. But when he develops gout from all the meats, his chances of being able to go to a middle school dance go out the window. And he prefers it this way as he's concerned over the fact that his relationship with Connie might become complicated if the two kiss at the end of the dance. So he starts floating up on more and more meat to prevent having to dance with her, something which Connie views as proof that Bobby doesn't like her. When he realizes that he does like Connie more than he likes meat, he hops to the dance and fights through the pain, the advice his father had hoped to give to him. Meanwhile, Hank is fighting the Dallas Museum of Modern Art over its inclusion of an exhibit that uses Hank's clogged colon from the episode Hank's Unmentionable Problem, eventually learning from Buck Strickland that it's a crime in the state of Texas to disparage beef, a law he enforces to get the picture taken down. Bobby is nervous about his relationship with Connie developing, citing previous heartbreaks as proof that adding an additional complexity to the romance can only result in making things worse. He's happy with the state of things between the two of them, and doesn't want to take any risks at changing things for the better or worse. But without some risk, nothing ever changes. This might be fine for Bobby, but Connie is more willing to take a chance to improve things, seen here when she lies about having a date in order to make Bobby jealous enough to try to win her back. Bobby himself is at least semi-aware of this fact as well. He knows that he needs to eventually take a chance, but fears the end result. So he begins to eat incessantly, so that he might be able to avoid confronting the situation head-on. As long as he has gout, he has an excuse to put off a decision even longer. But getting gout in Bobby's case is a decision in and of itself, which is why Connie is upset with his choice. Back to Hank, he fears his privacy being violated by the use of his colon in an art exhibit, made worse by the fact that it's in a modern art museum, which he doesn't understand in the first place. While HIPAA wouldn't take effect in Texas until two years after this episode aired, he still views it as a violation of his rights, but it's not until he learns that disparaging beef also disparages propane that he really begins to take offense. So much so, in fact, that he's willing to take the uncharacteristic approach of litigation to defend himself. Hank's Cowboy Movie Hank and Bobby make a road trip to Wichita Falls, Texas so they can watch the Dallas Cowboys training camp. And while there, Bobby enjoys all the sights and sounds of the other city, lamenting at how boring his hometown is once they return. Realizing that there's no future in Arlen, Hank gets the alley together to film a movie that they plan on sending in to the Dallas Cowboys in order to convince them to move their training camp to the town. 
Hank tries directing the movie, with Peggy writing the script and Nancy as the spokeswoman, but a series of disagreements and arguments over the film results in everyone leaving but Hank, who films a terrible movie in their absence. When Bobby and Peggy see him talking to his Tom Landry plate, apologizing for his failure, Peggy decides to make his dream come true, gathering home movies from the street and having them edited together in a highlight reel of the community's best moments. This film ends up not getting them the movie that they wanted, but Bobby and Hank still end up bonding over the fact that Bobby won't be moving out anytime soon. Hank loves his hometown, loves the cowboys, and loves his son, and he wants everything to stay together for as long as possible. Once he starts to realize the reality that Bobby won't stay around forever, he begins to search for a way to keep things the way they are, to capture this moment in his life and have it stick around forever. If he can show off how great his town is and let other people see Arlen the way he sees it, then perhaps he can convince not just the cowboys, but the whole world that things ought to stop changing. A major theme of King of the Hill is about Hank's anxieties over the changing world that he lives in. He has a great deal of satisfaction with his life with the few things that bother him all coming from outside influences, someone or something different challenging the status quo. But to Hank, the only reason a person would dare to change the world is if they're dissatisfied with it, which is a fair assumption to make, and his counter-strategy is to show how good things are. This ends up being done through the film at the end. All the shared memories that Rainy Street has show him just how great his life is. And although it's not enough to convince Bobby to stay or the cowboys to come over, it's still enough that Hank himself can be satisfied with his life thus far. And if things were good, and are still good, then you can count on the fact that they will continue to be good. Dogdale Afternoon Dale borrows Hank's mower and takes it for a joyride, mistreating it and leaving it near a gas station. Later on, he buys a new mower and begins to brag about how much better it is than everyone else's. So to humble him, Hank, Bill, and Boomhauer steal Dale's lawnmower and hide it in Hank's garage, sending him taunting letters about it to mess with him as he leans further and further into conspiratorial thinking about its whereabouts. But when Bobby finds the mower and doesn't understand why his father would play this sort of prank on a friend, Hank returns the mower with the intention of revealing the ruse. But Bill sees Dale at the top of the university's tower holding his spray wand and believes that the man has snapped. The tower is surrounded by police who believe that he's a sniper, and Hank has to go up there to talk them down. As they're descending the stairs, a vigilante takes a shot at Dale, which Hank dies in front of, saving the man's life after it's revealed that he had a bulletproof vest. Dale has always been portrayed as a harmless individual, but mostly through the eyes of his friends and neighbors who know him well. From an outsider's perspective, it would be easy to make the connection between his skeptical views on everything and potentially harmful methods of thinking. Even in the 90s, most conspiracy theorists were just anti-Semites with extra steps. We see this in the vigilantes who try to shoot at Dale despite the police already having the tower surrounded. They believe they're more correct than everybody else, and as a result, nearly get Hank killed. Much of the appeal to this type of, they don't want you to know, thinking isn't about being smart, but about feeling smart, the way that Dale gets his new mower, mostly so he can show off. Dale himself has also developed significantly since his earlier iterations. At first he was just a small government libertarian stereotype with more free time than common sense. While he exposited the occasional theory during episodes, he rarely acted on these and was much more down to earth. But as the seasons went on, he became flanderized to the point of being little more than a single aspect of the initial pitch. His voice even became higher, goofier, as the seasons went on to reflect how disconnected he's become to the real world. His initial unawareness of Nancy's affair went from believable to comical, as did the rest of his characterization. Revenge of the Ludafisk the church's pastor announces his retirement, announcing his replacement as a Minnesota woman named Karen Stroop. Despite the congregation's initial anxieties about a female minister, Hank and the others quickly warm up to her at a potluck held the Saturday before her first sermon. But Bobby secretly eats all the lutefisk, a dish Karen brought, and throws out the evidence before he gets caught, making it look as though somebody threw out the dish as a sort of protest against her joining the church. The next day, Bobby is feeling guilty slash gassy over eating all the fish, and goes to the bathroom where Cotton Hill has just stormed off to after announcing his displeasure towards a female pastor. He lights some matches to ward off the smell, which Bobby ends up using to try to dispose of the evidence, which then catches the bathroom on fire, eventually burning down the whole church. 
Everybody assumes Cotton did it, and he's even arrested by the arson investigator. But after meeting up with Dee Dee, who tells him about taking responsibilities for once accidents while discussing her unborn child, Bobby decides to confess to the arson to his family. But instead of going to the police about it, Cotton volunteers to confess in his stead, as he's old and Bobby has his whole life ahead of him. Bobby was, at first, embarrassed about eating all the lutefisk, hiding the evidence more so out of shame than anything else. But when the rest of the churchgoers begin to suspect a hate crime was at play, he can't confess due to the association the fish now had. As the time went on, more and more people began to get behind the idea that Karen Stroop was being attacked for her gender, making everything Bobby did behind the scenes gain a worse and worse appearance, instead of the more innocent reasoning behind his actions. He's not a sexist setting out to hurt women, just a kid who likes fish a bit too much, but by the midpoint of the episode, that's not what anybody is prepared to see. This is the major reason why Cotton is declared guilty. His motivations match up with the motivations everyone assumes the arsonist had, even though his story doesn't actually match with both crimes, as he wasn't even in Arlen when the Lutefisk was thrown out. But once the mob starts demanding justice, they don't really care where or how that justice is dispensed, willing to lock up Cotton more for his character than his actual actions. And while there's a lesson to be taught here about a bad personality getting you in more trouble than you're actually culpable for, the real moral comes from Bobby not confessing earlier. If he'd admitted it from the start, it would have easily been played off as Karen being a great cook instead of a hate crime. Death and Texas Peggy receives a letter from a death row convict describing how she was the most influential person in his life, and when she visits the man, he explains that he wants to be taught how to read. Peggy, won over by his words, decides to come over once a week to help the man out, eventually playing boggle with him and bringing his boggle set from his house. Hank is mortified that Peggy is visiting a death row inmate, saying that he can't be trusted and that he's not worth her time, to which Peggy doubles down on teaching the man to prove her husband wrong. But he continuously loses the timers and asks Peggy to bring him more and more, and soon it's revealed that the sand she's been bringing in is actually coke. He threatens Peggy to bring more, stating that he'll snitch on her as a drug mule if she doesn't. But when Hank and Peggy decide to come clean about it, it turns into his word against hers, and since he sold all the evidence against her, he's simply taken back to jail with Peggy getting away with it. Peggy tries to prove herself by teaching a death row inmate to read, mostly because she was told not to do it. That's just her personality. When Peggy is told no, she assumes she's being told as such as an insult to her abilities, rather than because it's a bad idea. Her oversized ego is what motivates her to do almost everything, and this is something that, while shamed by the narrative, is never viewed negatively by Hank himself. He has the opportunity to gloat and say, I told you so to her, but refuses to do so as he himself knows his wife well enough to understand that saying such a thing would only damage her ego, one of the best parts about her. Because while Peggy may not be as smart as she thinks she is, she's still as nice as she believes herself to be. Her entire motivation in this episode was to teach a death row inmate how to read after the rest of society had given up on him, not necessarily something that a person ought to be shamed for. So many of her other actions are also motivated by spreading her intelligence to others. It's the reasons she substitute teaches in the first place. Peggy is a good person, she's just bad at it, and a person's perception of her largely depends on if they're judging her actions or her intentions. Wings of the Dope Luann tries to re-enroll in beauty school where there's a test coming up that she's unprepared for. Meanwhile, Hank and the alley convince Khan to let them fix his trampoline, which he got from Buckley's estate. While they're fixing it up, Luann sees Buckley's angel jumping on it and joins him, with the religious experience giving her the motivation to keep studying and stop crying. Hank is excited for her to have this boon despite not believing in the angel himself, but the rest of the neighborhood begins to worship slash fear the trampoline, asking it for miracles and the like. Even Luann, who starts to depend on Buckley's angel to give her guidance, but stops receiving it. She stays up all night studying with Peggy, only to end up crashing her car when she argues with Buckley's angel on the drive to the exam, where a group of community college students see her, asking her if she's alright. Luann ends up dropping out of beauty school and getting her tuition refunded, going instead to community college. Back on Rainy Street, Hank sprays his friends with the hose to get them out of their religious fervor. 
This episode adds to the continuity of King of the Hill by changing the path Luann is taking through life, sending her to a community college instead of beauty school. Later in the show's run, she'll return to beauty school after dropping out of college, giving a sort of roundabout sort of nothingness to her arc that results in her character going nowhere. But this is by design. Characters in TV shows are standardized as King of the Hill are rarely developed beyond a basic premise in order to make the episodes viewable in any order. And while Mike Judd would butt heads with Fox over the level of serialization in the show, we ultimately did get something with the desire to keep things consistent. So Luann never gets to graduate beauty school and move out, because that would either mean writing her out of most plots, or contriving a way to keep her around in some other capacity, which does end up happening. But it's not to say that her shift to community college is a pointless endeavor either. King of the Hill is a show that tries to make statements and put its characters into relatable situations in order to present an issue or argument. So to have Luann enter community college creates opportunities to involve her in different types of plots that don't revolve around beauty school as a setting, something that two male showrunners would likely struggle to relate to, whereas having a college-educated character is much easier to write for due to the shared experience. Take me out of the ball game. The Chamber of Commerce is hosting an Arlen co-ed softball team, and Hank is put in charge of coaching for Strickland Propane. Thatterton announces that he has a former Texas Ranger on his team, as he's married to one of his employees, so Hank tries to convince Peggy to join as pitcher, knowing she's talented at it. She's hesitant to play, as Hank has never fully supported her softball career, but when she overhears Coach Kleehammer saying that woman can't play, she decides to prove him wrong. Strickland starts winning games due to Peggy shutting out the other teams, but Hank refuses to acknowledge that she's their star player, giving himself all the credit for his coaching. After an argument between the two, Peggy starts to lose her ability to pitch, and Hank later realizes that his presence makes her unable to focus. So he takes himself out of the game, allowing Peggy to strike out the former Major League player to win the league. In the B-plot, Bobby tries to compete against the Arrow Girls' cookie sales by begging his own, causing a feud between himself and Connie as a proxy for their relationship. But when the other girls start destroying his cookie stand, Connie stands up for him, and the two announce that they're dating in earnest. Hank has ambitions of being a great coach, even likening his position to Tom Landry at the start of the episode. As such, he tries to take credit for every little thing that his team does well, despite how limited his actual involvement was, which is a lesson that he ought to have learned from earlier in the season, from the episode Three Coaches and a Bobby. But his refusal to learn and adapt from past lessons is ultimately what puts his career and the softball team in jeopardy. He tries to drill fundamentals into Peggy's mind, despite her already being a competent pitcher without his aid. He fails to make the connection between his help and the reality of the team's situation until the very end of the episode. Bobby takes after his father in this way, though with a slight difference. While Hank is oblivious to the idea that things might not fit his worldview, Bobby is aware that he and Connie's relationship has evolved from the way that it once was, but he refuses to accept or adapt to this change. His story is one of active resistance, while Hank resists the change of acknowledging that his wife can play more passively. But Bobby gets the excuse of nervousness, that his evolving relationship could lead to a conflict, such as the argument over their differing cookies. Whereas Hank simply doesn't accept the fact that he might be wrong in the first place, Bobby is secretly hoping that his fears about himself and Connie are wrong. As Old As The Hills Hank and Peggy invite the whole neighborhood over to their 20th wedding anniversary, where Hank has a slideshow of all their best moments. But Peggy is lamenting over the fact that she's become old, and that all the dreams she had when she was first marrying Hank are gone, made worse by Dee Dee getting all the attention because of her pregnancy, while she and Hank have struggled to conceive. After a disappointing dinner together, Peggy decides that she wants to have more excitement, and gets the idea to go skydiving. Meanwhile, Bobby is prepared to enjoy his last weekend being spoiled by Cotton, but due to Dee Dee being too pregnant to raise him, he ends up doing chores the whole time until the baby starts to arrive. Then he has to drive her to the hospital. Up on the plane, Hank jumps and enjoys the excursion, but Peggy is too nervous to make the leap, until she learns that Dee Dee's had the baby. So she jumps from the plane, only for both of her parachutes to fail, crashing into the ground as the episode ends. Peggy is afraid that she's growing too old to do anything exciting with her life, that as she gets older and older, the number of opportunities starts to decrease, and she'll eventually be saddled into a daily routine with less excitement until she eventually dies a boring life. 
This is made worse by the fact that having a second child was something she thought of as a means of having a second chance at leading an interesting life. And seeing Dee Dee and Cotton becoming parents makes her feel even worse if they get to do something that she can't. But while she sulks about this at the start of the episode, she does eventually come around, not wanting to be outdone by Cotton, who's much older than she is, or Hank, who's much more down to earth than she is. Pun not intended. Hank himself is a bit more of an interesting inversion on Peggy's anxieties here. While Peggy fears living a boring life, Hank wants that more than anything. His idea of success is to have the button-down lifestyle of selling propane and drinking in the alley. Hank Hill has found the metrics of success that he was setting out to achieve, and yet, it's Peggy's desire for more that wakes him up to the idea of trying out new things. When the two are lamenting at how boring their 20th anniversary was, Hank starts to realize that perhaps he set his sights too low, and should have been more ambitious. After all, doesn't the American Dream posit that if you have everything you ever wanted, it just means that you didn't want enough? Season 4 As long as Mike Judge and Greg Daniels were heavily involved in the production of King of the Hill, the show maintained a strong character focus while having the occasional plot development, something that was unusual for standardized television, but not unheard of, as any show would try to involve gimmicks after so many seasons to shake things up. But the changes to the status quo that King of the Hill had were rarely done out of a need to make the show more interesting for the sake of refreshment, but were instead often things planned in advance as a logical follow-up to so many stories being told. Season 4 was the last season run by one of the original duo, and as such, the last season to really capture the original feel of the show, or at least, that's what one would have expected. Season 4 shows a strong shift towards plots that involve locations that put the stress on the psyches of the main cast. There's more travel involved, and the situation that the cast gets himself into stop being things that the average viewer at home has any experience with. But this isn't to say that these are bizarre or alien situations, they're just uncommon. While the average person might not experience the same things as the Hill family, they still reasonably could experience such things. And of course, this is sold even further by the reactions that the cast has to these experiences. Not so much that they react the way we would, but in the way that we would expect them to. King of the Hill went from a show about everyday people and everyday situations, to a show about stereotypes of these peoples and locations. But that's as much a result of the show getting old, as it is from the characters getting more fleshed out. They don't act like us, because we're boring. Peggy Hill, The Decline and Fall Hank finds Peggy lying in a field of mud, alive but delirious. She's taken to the hospital where she's put into a full body cast to immobilize her while she recovers from a broken back. In the same hospital, Dee Dee has given birth to a child that Cotton names Good Hank, but she's too overcome with postpartum depression to so much as carry the child, and Cotton wants nothing to do with what he considers to be woman's work. So it's up to Bobby to take care of the baby, while Hank cares for Peggy, which he's hoping to do without her remembering the moments before leaping from the plane, as Hank thinks he was the one who encouraged her to jump. But Peggy eventually remembers that it wasn't Hank, but the news of the baby's delivery that did make her jump. The baby, who is now sitting next to her in the living room, being cared for in the same way that she is. Bobby eventually snaps from having to take care of Good Hank, Cotton, and Dee Dee all at once, and leaves the baby behind while Hank tries to shame his father into taking care of G.H., leaving Peggy alone with the crying child, while she manages to calm it down by rocking him with her big toe. Peggy jumped from the plane because she wanted a thrill, something that she had subconsciously accepted she could not get from raising another child after hearing that Dee Dee had given birth. That was the exact moment that her dreams of having a child were given up on, so she jumps to claim some sort of thrill for herself. She then forgets about this logic upon hitting the ground and it takes several days to regain the memories of how she came to that conclusion, but when she does, it hits her that now not only will she likely not be able to have another child, nor was it a wise idea to jump from the plane, but the one place where she could have possibly found some other relief in raising good Hank is gone because of her cast. This episode essentially takes away Peggy's agency to the Hill family dynamic and then shows the end result. Without Peggy to keep things running, no one else has the ability to take care of themselves. Sure, Bobby and Hank were able to keep things under control for a while, but they gave in to pressure after about a week, while Cotton quit hours afterwards and Dee Dee didn't even make it out of the hospital. 
By removing a character from the plot for a while, we're able to see the role they served in better detail by looking at what's missing, and this episode shows off that Peggy can do more for the Hill family with her big toe than anyone else. Cotton's Plot Peggy gets her full body cast removed and enrolls in a physical therapy course, though the course is moving a bit too slowly for her preference. But when she's left alone with Cotton, who starts insulting her for not being able to walk, she finds herself able to work harder out of spite. So she drops out of physical therapy to work with Cotton, who runs a BMT-style regiment of making her crawl and insulting her. And this strategy works. He tells her his old war stories while she's working out, with Peggy even agreeing to compile them for an application to the Texas State Cemetery. But she and Hank begin to notice inconsistencies in the stories, and Peggy soon comes to the conclusion that he is a fraud. This makes it difficult to walk again, and she re-enrolls in her old therapy course, but Hank is able to reinvigorate her when he tells her the truth. Cotton lost his shins in the war, and relearned how to walk. And this is enough for Peggy to resubmit his application, getting him the spot. In the end, Cotton invites Peggy to crawl up the hill, saying that if she can, she can dance on his grave, which the two then do. Hank Hill notoriously doesn't know how to express his emotions, and this is something that he learned from his father, who is equally incapable of doing so. But it's not like they're not there. Cotton does feel a bit of sympathy for Peggy's condition, as it reminds him of his own struggles with regaining the use of his legs, and so he tries to form a close relationship with her the only way he knows how to, a drill sergeant's relationship to one of his recruits. As awkward and semi-abusive as this relationship is, it's still the greatest expression of love that Cotton is capable of, and so it becomes heartwarming in a cosmic sort of way. But this is a relationship built on mutual gain as well as the respect that Peggy has for the man's military service. When she learns that his stories don't add up, that respect is gone, and when a man you don't respect tries to order you to do something, it's not going to have the intended motivating effect, partially why Peggy struggles in her initial physical therapy class. She does ultimately get back her motivation to relearn to walk when that respect comes back. It's not that she loves Cotton or even likes him, but that she acknowledges his accomplishments and his expertise in the field of overcoming her particular hardship. And respect is something earned, not given, just as Cotton's plot is something that he earns too. Bills are made to be broken. The guys are standing around the alley when they hear from a local sports show that Bill's old touchdown record is about to be broken by a local high schooler named Ricky Suggs. They're concerned about Bill's mental health, as his high school record is all that he has, but Bill seems to be taking it in stride, even as the record is tied. But when Ricky's ACL is torn during a play and he's assumed out of the season, the other team simply allows him a courtesy touchdown to give him the record. The guys are disgusted by this, trying to get Suggs' record to be listed with an asterisk next to it for the poor display of sportsmanship, but the rest of Arlen doesn't view it this way as they view his record-setting touchdown as a heartwarming story. But while reminiscing on the good old days, Hank realizes that Bill never graduated high school and can play football as a redshirt, giving him one last opportunity to regain his record. Despite several injuries and not being in peak condition, Bill manages to overcome the other team's defense and score, tying the record honestly. As Bill states in this episode, he appreciates Ricky Suggs taking his own record as the buzz around the event gives him more attention, allowing him a brief moment to relive his glory days. The record had, for a long time, merely existed as a symbol of his decline. He no longer fits into his old uniform, he's out of shape, and his best days are far behind him. But getting the spotlight for a few weeks gives him the chance for that symbol to actually mean something instead of just representing it. This is why, when the record is broken illegitimately, it cheapens the whole experience. If a record can be handed to somebody out of obligation, then the record itself doesn't mean much, ignoring the fact that Ricky would have beaten the record honestly in the first place had it not been for the injury. And so the only way for Bill to reclaim the record is to reclaim what the record means, to earn it, and show that it shouldn't have been given away. Most of the town has accepted the former definition, so they view Bill with disgust as his attempts to steal a record from somebody who has given it in a display of sportsmanship. But when he regains it through his own efforts, it's not Bill who's being given the respect, but his accomplishment itself. Even though Bill only manages to tie Ricky, he earned every single touchdown and therefore has the higher accolade, made better by the fact that he taught Arlen to appreciate the effort as well. Little Horrors of Shop 
Hank is forced to take a vacation by Buck Strickland, and he doesn't know what to do with his time. While driving Bobby home from school, he learns that the shop class at Tom Landry Middle School is being used as a study hall, so he volunteers to teach the class himself, despite the budget not being able to pay him anything. He quickly wins the hearts of the students by teaching them practical lessons on how to repair and create things, even having the students go around the school to repair things there when they don't have the wood to run the class properly. But this makes Peggy jealous, as she was confident that she would win Substitute Teacher of the Year for the third year in a row. But when Hank is fired for telling his students to bring their own tools from home, they simply show up at his house outside of regular hours to continue learning. Peggy rebrands as Mrs. Hank Hill to try to get some of his votes, and in the end, despite being ineligible for the award, the whole school still applauds when Hank walks out on stage to give Peggy her speech. Hank and Peggy both have completely different motivations going into their substitute teaching careers. Hank is doing it out of a passion for the subject and a desire to make an impact. Peggy does so for her own ego. And while I've spoken before in this video about Peggy's motivations, this episode puts the same desire into a more negative context. She begins to grow bitter over being one-upped by her husband, made worse by the fact that he's effortlessly getting a bit of recognition that she believes she deserves. Substitute teaching is how Peggy defines herself, and so to be told that she's only the second best at it damages her self-image more than anything else. And this is what starts to define a trend in Peggy's characterization going forward. It's a common subject to talk about when discussing King of the Hill that Peggy is not a very good person due to her ego and lack of abilities to match that ego up. But I'd argue that this part of her character is something that really only becomes pronounced during the later seasons while getting retroactively applied to her earlier appearances. In the first three seasons, Peggy is still a good person, just getting in over her head because she overestimates herself. But in the later seasons, basically anything post-skydiving, she becomes a much more fragile person. If this episode had taken place a few years later, Peggy likely would have actively tried to sabotage Hank's career. Isle 8A Khan and Min are going to Hawaii for a week so Khan can give a speech, but without a babysitter, they have to leave Connie in the hands of the Hill family. Bobby is excited to camp out in the living room with Connie, and she even gets along with Hank and Peggy by impressing them with her manners. But after the second day, she starts to spend a long time in the bathroom and upon leaving, tells Hank that she just got her first period. Hank is mortified, not knowing what to do and too embarrassed to ask anybody else about it, though he's finally able to help out Connie by taking her to Megalomart's Isle 8A. Afterwards, Bobby is confused as he's not sure where her mood swings are coming from. But when Min and Con return home, Min's able to explain things to her daughter, and Connie's able to negotiate with Bobby based on the two not hating each other. Meanwhile, Dale gets a new trash can that's indestructible, but it gets taken by the garbage truck when it's too thin to be held by the claw. There's a stigma around visits from Aunt Flo, or the time of the month, or whatever other allegory one uses to prevent outright saying period. Especially among older men, this sort of topic is something that's treated with a large amount of awkwardness, even more than usual from Hank, and so it becomes something embarrassing to bring up. This then leads to an extra layer of stigmatization around any additional aspects, such as Connie's PMS or if someone has low iron, and so these issues often go undiagnosed and misunderstood. This is seen in Bobby, who starts to believe that Connie hates him because he never gets a frank understanding of what's going on. Even Connie herself doesn't quite understand her own hormonal changes, feeling as though she's doing something wrong because she exists. But despite neither of the two really understanding what's going on or why all the adults in their lives are treating it so gingerly, they still agree to a mutual tolerance of one another. By being understanding, they can navigate an issue that they don't quite understand. Even the adults end up having a poor grasp of events, mostly Hank and Con, who undergo a similar form of understanding as the two leave the issue to their wives to handle. In the end, it's not about understanding everything about an issue, undoing centuries of skittishness, but about being nice enough to avoid acting like an expert and just accepting other people. A Beer Can Named Desire Hank wins a contest from an Alamo beer can that gives him a trip to meet Don Meredith, as well as the option to either make a 10-yard pass through a narrow hole for $1 million, or have Don perform the pass instead for 100000 Hank makes a replica of the giant beer can he'll have to throw the ball into, and practices, getting confident enough to decide to go for the million. But when they arrive, he second-guesses himself and has Don Meredith make the throw for him, and the guy misses. 
Hank demands an apology and learns from Don that the guy really was trying, to which Hank realizes that he should be more accepting of his decision, even if it turned out to be the wrong one. Meanwhile, Bill is dropped off at the Dotrieve Manor in Louisiana, where he meets his three cousins, all of whom are desperate to continue the bloodline. But he learns from Peggy that one of them is his biological cousin, and fears getting too close to any of them, before eventually being kicked out for trying to fool around. Hank is, if nothing else, a very modest person. He's not the type of guy who needs to make it big, he doesn't obsess over wealth, and the only thing he wants money for is to provide for his family. When discussing the throw with Peggy, his first instinct with what to do with the money is to put Bobby through college. Hank doesn't take risks if he can help it, and always tries to live a reserved and modest life. So many episodes are conflict over something trying to throw him off his groove. Hank is, if nothing else, a very prideful person. He's not the type of guy who can stand to have his credentials questioned, and will always try to drop his accomplishments in propane or football if the opportunity arises. When discussing that throw with Peggy, he insists on going for the $1 million despite not even being able to brainstorm something to spend all the money on. Hank doesn't sit idly by if he hears an insult, whether that's an insult to him, to Texas, or to propane. So when those two ideals are put into conflict, Hank has to choose whether his reputation as a star football player or his family and ideals are more valuable. How confident is he in his ability to provide for them if he's willing to gamble on their happiness in the first place? And then for the safe option to wind up failing anyway is just another hit to his ego, at least until he learns how similar he and Don Meredith are as well. It's an assuring thing that he ended up putting his trust in a man just like himself, even if that trust didn't pay off. Happy Hanksgiving. Hank is on his way to the airport to visit Peggy's mother in Montana, a propane-cooked turkey in tow to prove a point about the fuel. But their flight is delayed by poor weather, forcing the family to sit hungry in the airport as Hank refuses to play into Con's gambit of pretending to own a walk restaurant to get free food. Eventually, their flight is postponed to the next day, and in trying to skip the line for an airport shuttle to the hotel, they get a ride from Bill, who crashes the car, making the family walk there in time to see vacancy run out. After spending the night in the airport, they finally get on the next flight, only for it to be delayed as the dogs there sniff out Hank's turkey, and the meat is detonated, delaying the flight long enough that it gets outright cancelled. Meanwhile, Dale is searching for a place to smoke in the airport, only to get locked outside, while Boomhauer sleeps with flight attendants, and Khan leaves his flight to rescue Dale. In the end, nobody gets to go on their trip, and the food court closes, so they celebrate with leftover pizza and packaged nuts. Holiday travel is stressful, enough so that the Hill family and their friends are able to completely change priorities throughout the event. While Peggy is mostly concerned with her Brown Betty recipe's consistency in the early acts of the episode, by the second, she's just concerned with getting there, and by the end, she's only happy the family didn't collapse in on each other. Even Hank is mostly concerned with showing off how well he can cook a turkey, only to end up losing his chance to brag, at least until the end, when he's finally able to use the tanky stored at the episode's beginning to reheat the pizza. He misses out on the opportunity to brag about propane to Peggy's mother, but he's still surrounded by people who agree with him in the end, and that plays into why the episode's ending is a happy one. Thanksgiving started out as a story about unity between American Indians and pilgrims, but has meant a lot of things to a lot of different people over the years, even more or less going forgotten about for a few centuries. But regardless of what the holiday used to mean, or why it was brought back into the public spotlight, what it is today is an excuse to spend time with family, no matter whether that family is blood-related or not. Not in my backhoe. Hank gets upset with Dale and Bill for misusing a backhoe they rented to replace Bill's septic tank. While at the hardware store to cool off, he meets a man named Hal with the same interests, fashion, and truck as himself, and the two begin to see each other around town. Hank begins to spend more and more time around Hal in lieu of his other friends, who view it as treachery, as they begin to follow the two men around. Dale and Bill then come to the conclusion that Hank is friends with Hal because the other guy knows how to use the backhoe, and they decide to take the machine for a joyride to practice. But then they fall into a pit and trap themselves. Later on, Hank learns that Hal's schedule doesn't line up with his, and the two live too far away to meet up under any other circumstances. So they part ways around the time that Hank learns that the backhoe was never returned, and he searches for Dale and Bill, eventually finding them in the pet cemetery where he guides them through digging themselves out. 
I've asked before what Hank could possibly see in his friend group, and, and this episode gives a rather cynical answer. They live nearby. Hank is a man who values consistency in his life above all else, and despite the fact that he's made a genuine friend, a guy just like him, he still opts to spend time around people who he's always known. It's not just the people in his life that he wants consistency in, though. Hank also wants the dynamics between these people to stay constant. And when he realizes that his friends don't like Hal, he tries to get back that old sense of the way things are. And so this is to say that just because two people are similar, it doesn't really mean that they're suitable for one another. A great example of this is the marriage of Hank and Peggy. The two are very different people, but Hank likes it that way. Peggy gets him into things he would not have done otherwise, and his friends are the same way. Without Dale or Bill or even Boompower, Hank's life would be uninteresting. And while he might believe himself suited to that sort of life, he still does crave the dynamic of his friend group. He likes to consider himself the expert in things, and he does get that with the alley. To Kill a Ladybird After being upset with Ladybird for her lack of energy, Bobby finds a raccoon that he names Bandit, and begins to feed it every night, allowing it to live in the crawl space where it gets into the house and tears up Hank's garage. Hank sends Dale in to catch the raccoon, but it scratches him repeatedly and runs off, getting into a fight with Ladybird, who chases after him. Hank searches for Ladybird, Bobby searches for Bandit, and the rest of the neighborhood searches for Dale, who's run into the woods believing that he has rabies. But when Hank learns that Animal Control intends to shoot his dog should she appear rabid, he sets out on his own to find her before they can. While in the woods, he begins to reminisce on the good times he's had with his pet before Dale ambushes them and ties the two up, only for Ladybird to come back and chase him off. In the end, Bobby and Hank are freed when Bobby shoots a charging bandit, where they learn that no one had rabies after all. The difference in treatment of Ladybird is one of the ways in which we can see the clear difference between Bobby and Hank. Bobby wants an energetic dog, one who will run around and play games with him, somebody more like Bandit as a companion. Hank prefers the quiet, laid-back Ladybird, not purely because she's the dog he's had for so many years, but because she represents his life the way he lives it now. We've seen the dog as a puppy, energetic and playful, always running around, and trying various new things out of curiosity, the same way Hank and Peggy were in their early years of their marriage. We've also seen Hank as an older adult. As he enters his middle ages, he's no longer as energetic or active, and so Ladybird has grown alongside him in the same way. This is one of the reasons why Hank is saddened by the potential loss of his dog. It's not only a decades-long companion he might lose, but a representation of some of the best years of his life. If Ladybird dies, so too does his young adulthood. At the end of the episode, he and Bobby are walking Ladybird back to the truck, and he allows Bobby to pick out their next pet if, when, Ladybird passes away. The man finally accepting that it's time for him to step aside and let the next stage of his life begin, alongside Bobby and the family he has now. And of course, Ladybird does live, not very active, but still as a symbol of everything that ever once was. Hillenium. Hank is buying a Christmas tree for Christmas 1999, but the rest of the city seems to be stocking up for Y2K, which they believe will be apocalyptic, as computers will fail to roll over and data will be lost. Hank and Dale aren't worried about the bug, but seeing how panicked Peggy is over the potential damage, Hank decides to buy her a new computer, though the store can't make the sale as their systems are all down for compliance checking. Worse is when he tries to sell propane to a crowd of hoarders, only to learn that the deliveries have been stalled as well. So he takes the last of the propane for himself, hiding it in his garage. Hank begins to worry about the panicking crowds, and is joined by Dale when the latter's supply hoard is ruined by his gerbils. And the two drive around preparing for an apocalypse. Hank buys Peggy a grandfather clock instead of the computer, and he gets his family equally technologically impaired gifts as well. But after an argument that results in him varnishing the clock to cool down, he ends up collapsing from the lack of ventilation in his garage, and hallucinates a Tom Landry whack-a-mole, lecturing him on when it's okay not to worry. In the end, he burns the hoard of supplies he was stockpiling, and the bonfire brings out the whole neighborhood. The Y2K crisis was one caused by panic over the thought that computers would fail to roll over properly at the end of the millennium, presenting the year 1900 instead of the correct date. The fear was that the misaligned dates would cause entire networks to crash, but the reality of the situation was that, at worst, a few parking meters gave out improper tickets, and some cash registers failed for a few days. The collapse did not happen, and most of the damage was caused not by computers, but by people. 
survivalist-related businesses saw an uptick in sales between surplus stores, gun dealers, and outdoor recreation equipment, and any supply chain issues were caused more because of people attempting to hoard than from actual shortages. This episode takes that sense of panic and applies it to Arlen, Texas, with Hank, who is normally very calm and collected, buying into that panic after seeing everyone else go through with it. It's not so much that he actually feared the computers, as it was his fear of other people's fear that instilled the sense of panic. Because often, the greater damage to society can be caused by overreactions to information, rather than the information itself. Well, that and the varnish fumes. The real lesson of this story is to ventilate your garage. Old Glory When Bill sees the old flag at the military base being decommissioned by burning, he volunteers to hoist it over his home instead. Meanwhile, Bobby gets inspired by the sight of the flag to do a rewrite of a failing essay he wrote, but when he can't come up with a way to start it, he asks Peggy to write it for him, which she does upon learning that one of her rival substitute teachers, Mrs. Donovan, is the one who failed him in the first place. But when Peggy's essay gets an A, Bobby takes all the credit, and begins to receive requests from his classmates to help on their papers as well. But unable to write them himself, he simply plagiarizes musings from Peggy's newspaper column, which was recently cancelled. When his teacher notices the similarities between Peggy's column, which she bought ad space to rerun, and her students' essays, she demands that Peggy and Bobby give a formal apology during a pep rally. But Peggy comes up with the idea to make a new essay so patriotic that the students cheer for the apology instead, and they plan on stealing Bill's flag to do so. They end up accidentally ruining the flag in the process, and it's destroyed, though the sight of Bill crying over the desecrated flag is enough to inspire Bobby to write a proper essay in the end. Bobby is able to exploit Peggy's ego to get her to write the essay for him, something that she went along with to repair the damage to her ego from her column being pulled. But when she believes that she's finally vindicated herself, making her satisfied with the effort, she then discovers Bobby taking full credit, meaning that she hasn't actually received anything external for the effort. Because to Peggy, it's not enough to prove to herself that she's a good author, she needs other people to believe it as well. This is why she spends her own money trying to get her musings back in the paper, and why the conflict of the episode rises when she learns that she might have to apologize publicly. And so she and Bobby go to the one place they can think of to get them the support of the public that they want. Nationalism. By using the flag as a prop, they can redirect the student body's love of their country towards themselves, a similar tactic to the one used in the episode Little Horrors of Shop, where Peggy tries to ride the coattails of Hank's popularity. This plot builds off the theme in that episode's plot by involving Bobby in the event. He gets the same ego that Peggy has, developing when he finally receives a taste of the respect that came with people believing that he was smart. Rodeo Days The rodeo comes into town, and Hank thinks that signing Bobby up for a cattle roping would be a good way to get the boy interested in a sport. He shows some proficiency with the lasso, but while there finds his true calling, being a rodeo clown. But the rodeo clowns are constantly looked down upon by the cowboys, as well as the rest of society, including later on his friend Joseph, and Bobby has to keep his new career path a secret from his father, which works for a while as Hank is proud of his son for getting concussed and developing a saunter. But while at the rodeo later, Bill recognizes his underwear and Peggy's shoes on the clown, and Hank learns Bobby's real reason for revisiting the rodeo again and again. He forbids Bobby from performing any longer, until Joseph is thrown from his bull calf and the other clowns are unable to calm the bull down. So, with Hank's blessing, Bobby steps into the arena and manages to distract the bull, saving his friend and earning everyone's respect. In a real rodeo, the clowns are given the same, if not more, respect than the actual cowboys, as the cowboys try to avoid being chased by bulls, and the clowns actively seek that situation out. But in this episode, the relationship is portrayed as much less amicable than the reality in order to portray drama between Bobby failing to get respect from his family, and failing to get respect from his peers. He only begrudgingly gets the respect from other clowns when he's able to prove himself to them, and it takes the same actions to get the respect from others as well. Nobody respects Bobby until he proves useful, and then the episode can end happily. And this is one of the most frequently used plot beats in King of the Hill. Hank tries to get Bobby into or out of a new hobby. He instead attaches to something adjacent to that hobby. Hank is disappointed until either learning that the hobby is actually okay, or he gets proven right in the end. And these plot beats themselves are rarely about the characters themselves. More often than not, they exist as a means of exploring some kind of dynamic about society. 
Bobby's not given respect by a group until he proves himself functional to them, relatable to anybody whose career path gets a more fulfillment than recognition. Or Hank is too caught up in his own fashioned ways to appreciate when something is changing for the better. Hanky Panky Buck Strickland's wife divorces him and takes half of his assets, so he transfers ownership of Sugarfoot's barbecue to Hank, but Strickland Propane gets repossessed by his wife, Liz. She doesn't intend on changing anything, though, and promotes Hank Hill to manager, though after faking a propane emergency, it's revealed that she's only promoting Hank to get closer to him, so she might seduce him as revenge for the years of cheating that Buck put her through. Buck, meanwhile, is living with his mistress, Debbie, and she begins to lust after Hank as well, due to the fact that he's now her boss. Hank tries to prevent Peggy from learning about either of these incidents, which is made easier by the fact that Peggy technically owns half of Sugarfoot's and is busy overhauling the whole restaurant. Hank arranges for Liz and Buck to reunite at Sugarfoot's, and when they see what's become of the restaurant under Peggy, they all recall the years that they spent together and reunite. Though afterwards, Peggy hears a gunshot and checks the dumpster, where she finds Debbie's body. Hank's greatest fear in this episode comes from the potential reveal that he's been fooling around with other women other than Peggy. While these allegations aren't true, the threat of the rumor itself is what he's more afraid of, yet this is an invalid fear. During the episode, he gets accused by Buck of sleeping with the guy's wife and mistress, yet all it takes is Hank's word that he didn't do it to get the guy to believe him. Hank's character is so sturdy within his community that the rumors of him sleeping around would be easily dismissed by anyone who knows him well enough. And yet, he tries to hide it anyway. As a result, he ends up making Peggy worry unnecessarily, getting an accusation in the next episode that comes along with the territory of how much he's been hiding. Had Hank been more honest with his wife and more forthcoming about the incident, he could have saved himself the embarrassment, but the very fact that he was hiding something did more to raise suspicion around him than was ever necessary. High Anxiety Hank tries to recall his whereabouts the night of Debbie's murder. He accidentally smoked with Debbie's stoner roommate and slept in some bushes. After trying to walk through everything, he begins to suspect that he was the murderer, blacked out from accidentally getting high. Sheriff Mumford of Heimlich County starts to piece together corroborating evidence, including Hank's manager Patch in some bushes, his lighter in Debbie's apartment, and a recorded confession of his relationship with the girl. But Hank then realizes that he dropped the lighter in Debbie's apartment and that her roommate can back up his story, but to admit to this means that he would have to admit to smoking pot. So he lies when Gail goes to the police, and this makes Gail a suspect, getting him arrested. But during a case closed dinner, when Hank realizes that Mumford wants to give Gail the death penalty, Hank finally admits to their mutual alibi, turning the attention to Buck Strickland, who was planting evidence, only for a Texas Ranger to step in and reveal that he pieced together the real culprit behind Debbie's murder. Debbie herself. She was lying in wait to kill Buck, and accidentally shot herself while carrying too many things at once. In the last episode, Hank feared that others would begin to judge him harshly if he were to have certain events about himself revealed, but in this episode, those fears are instead twisted around, so Hank himself is the one judging Hank Hill the harshest. His lack of understanding about the effects of marijuana result in a misjudgment of his own character, similarly to the way that his lack of understanding of sexual relationships caused drama for him in the previous episode. A firm rejection following a better read of the relationship would have done him more favors, but instead he nearly accepts Ms. Liz's advancements due to not knowing any better. Hank himself is much more concerned with his reputation than his status as a felon due to his own strong opinions of his own character. When he's confronted by the sheriff about being a suspect, he's almost relieved to hear that it's part of the murder case. Even then, his fears are less about people accusing him of murder than they were about people finding out he'd partied with Gale. But it's this staunch belief in his own willpower that ends up making him do the right thing. In the last episode, Hank got into trouble because he was unwilling to tell the truth. And this one, he gets out of trouble by admitting to the things that he's culpable for, because that's what a good person, like Hank Hill believes himself to be, would do. Naked Ambition After a day trip to the river, Bobby accidentally walks in on Luann while she's showering, and he's shocked by the sight of a woman who's practically his sister, though Joseph seems to be into the idea. So into the idea that he wants to peep on Luann in the shower, but when he and Bobby are caught by Connie, she believes they were peeping on her, and Bobby's too ashamed to admit the truth. 
So she begins to date Chain with Sonasong, the guy her parents are trying to set her up with, in order to portray her anger with Bobby. But Bobby admits the truth to her, agreeing to take his shirt off for her because that's what they believe couples do, until Khan and Min walk in on them and react by grounding her. But Hank still supports their relationship and gives him advice on how he can still visit her in spite of Khan. Meanwhile, Boomhauer drifts downstream and winds up in Houston, where he's checked into a mental hospital because of his rambling. He calls Dale, who sneaks in, and calls Bill, who decides he likes it there and isn't sure if he wants to leave. But when their escape plans are thwarted, they finally agree to call Hank, who reveals that all three could have left whenever they wanted to. Connie's fear in this episode is twofold. Firstly, she's afraid of her relationship being revealed to her parents at the correct assumption that they'll react negatively. But the second is tied to the first, in that she's not sure if her relationship with Bobby is serious enough to risk making her parents angry over it. When she deduces that he's peeking on her instead of being more direct or peeking on his cousin instead, she realizes that she might have misjudged either him or his level of commitment, and so she decides to break things off. But twice during the episode, this sort of pressure placed onto their relationship ends up strengthening it. Connie pretends as though she's interested in moving on from Bobby in order to test his loyalty to her, if he'll pursue her even after the argument that he started. And this works, allowing the two to get closer and still maintaining some healthy distance. So much so that it's conflated with sexual desire to the horror of Khan and relief of Hank. Their relationship has more stress put on it later from Khan's reaction, making the fence higher and installing motion-activated lights to make it more difficult for the two to see each other. And once again, their relationship survives this challenge and comes out stronger because of it. Moving on up. Pops, one of the neighbors on Rainy Street, dies while mowing his lawn, and the alley considers renting out his house to use as their new hangout. But they're beaten to it by Luann, who's renting the place out instead as she's tired of all the rules Hank has for his home. She gets three new roommates to split rent and utilities with, all of whom are annoying to Hank in some capacity. But he's willing to put up with them as long as Luann no longer lives with him, and he gets his den back, although the other guys view it as an invitation to start hanging out there when one of Luann's roommates parks her car where they usually stand. Eventually, Luann is exhausted from the fact that she's the only one who pays rent or utilities, and her roommates call her a fascist for trying to enforce rules, leading her to the realization that she's becoming like Hank was before she left. But Luann's too prideful to admit that she can't handle living on her own, and tries to come up with another way to survive, simply closing out all of the accounts and blacking out the house while she camps on the lawn. Similarly to last season's The Wedding of Bobby Hill, this is an episode about the conflicting desires for independence and the extra responsibility coming with that freedom. And in that episode's review, I mentioned that the opposite side of the presented argument, in which a person burdens themselves with too many rules and fails to exercise freedom, is never properly expanded upon. And then this episode covers that point. Luann begins to take on extra responsibilities around the house in order to cover for her lazy roommates, who take advantage of the hospitality for their own benefit. The lesson taken away at the end of the episode is for Luann to be responsible for her own actions and nobody else's. And while this means doing away with things like power and water for a while, she does manage to get some amount of freedom back by doing so. She cuts out the dead weight from the household and forces them to manage for themselves. Had everybody chipped in a fair amount, they'd all be living a higher total standard of living instead of shaving in the pool or stealing power from Hank. But in the absence of other people's personal responsibility, sometimes all you can do is watch out for yourself. Bill of Sales While lamenting the loss of Sugarfoots and the management responsibilities that came with it, Peggy starts to look for another way to flex her management muscles and comes across MetaLife, a pyramid scheme that sells health foods. She tries to rope Hank and Luann into selling for her, but their sales figures are too poor to get her any recognition, until Bill volunteers to sell the bars on the army base and she learns that he's a natural salesman. So Peggy begins to exploit him by having the guy sell more and more until they're invited to a conference in San Antonio. But while they're there, Peggy's praise causes Bill to freak out and quit. With Peggy unable to sell the product on her own, she begins to fear not managing to make it any further until the rest of her family points out that Bill is motivated by insults. So Peggy goes back to Bill and begins to treat him poorly, motivating him to sell more and more of the product until she notices that his foot is bleeding. She then realizes that it's not worth it to make the national conference if that means hurting a friend, and decides to quit the business. 
Bill's unrequited crush on Peggy has been a long recurring part of the show since the first season, something usually played as a joke until this point where it becomes a point of drama. Because it's never viewed as something healthy for either of them, as Peggy effectively has a stalker, and Bill is coping with the loss of Lenore in an unhealthy way. That said, it's at least a decent sign for his psyche that he does like somebody like Peggy. Lenore was a toxic individual, and he's tried replacing her with other toxic people before, such as Leanne. But Peggy, while egoistic, is still at least a decent person, at least mostly. When she realizes that Bill is a pushover who can be exploited for personal gain, she begins to mistreat him much in the same way that every other woman in his life has. There's just something about Bill that brings out the worst in other people when he's nearby. His complete lack of ability to stand up for himself it makes others gain unchecked power over him. And with unchecked power comes a true revelation about the way they would act if they could live without social consequence. Peggy is, at the very least, able to realize that she's becoming a worse person by association and cuts things off with him. Though it usually takes somebody else making this realization to save Bill from his own lack of a spine. While Peggy is slowly becoming a worse person as the show goes on, by this point she at least has the self-awareness to try to fight back. Won't you pee my neighbor? The Sufanusin phone family are celebrating Pi Mai, the Laotian New Year. They invite their neighbors, as well as a few individuals that they want to suck up to, including a group of Buddhist monks who are searching for the reincarnation of Lama Senglug. They set out a test of selecting an object that used to belong to him for Connie and Chain Wasana Song to take. But while trying to distract Chain to give Connie an advantage, Bobby ends up accidentally selecting the correct item. The monks then believe that Bobby may be the reincarnation of this monk, and they teach the boy about some Buddhist teachings, which he takes too easily as he begins to settle disputes. But Hank is appalled by the new form of spirituality and tries to shut it down, only for Bobby to come to him for advice when he learns that, if he really is saying lug, he has to take a vow of celibacy. But Connie wants him to take the test seriously as a sign of respect for her religion, and he starts to fear that he may get the answer right. In the end, Bobby is asked to pick an item and chooses a mirror as he can see Connie's reflection in it. Despite the fact that the mirror was saying lugs, the monk still decides to fail him as though he chose Connie. Bobby never showed outward signs of spirituality before, and it took the monks telling him that he might be a reincarnated Lama for him to start to change his behavior. Afterwards, he begins to speak as though he were a reincarnation, right up until the point where he learns that this behavior might end up separating him from Connie. But it's also worth pointing out that this is not an inconsistency in his character, but a consistency in his relationship. The only reason Bobby began to embrace Buddhist ideals was because he wanted to show an amount of respect for Connie's religion to keep her happy. It was not until these two desires conflicted that he felt any hesitation. The faux spirituality also presents itself in other characters. The Sufanusin phone family has very little interest in practicing Buddhism throughout the episode, only inviting the monks to their PMI as they were trying to suck up to the neighbors. Khan and Min only bought into the search for Sanglug because they thought it would make them look good, and they never bothered with attending local Buddhist cultural events as there was nobody there to impress. Hank, too, is only ever really seen going to church when it's relevant to the plot. He's not even able to answer Bobby's questions about what a Methodist is without asking for help. And of course, this is the first time we see him praying at his bedside in the show, not because of devotion, but because of anxiety. Hank's Bad Hair Day Hank's barber, Jack, is beginning to become senile and loses his ability to cut hair properly. But despite getting a subpar haircut, Hank insists on returning to give the man a second chance, only for Jack to bleach his hair. He's mortified and unable to leave the house without a hat, but Bill volunteers to give him a haircut. Despite Hank's initial uncertainty at letting his friend cut his hair, he agrees. The haircut is a success, and Hank loves it so much that he insists on paying Bill, though Bill doesn't know how much to charge, so he has the army find out how much it costs and bill Hank for the amount. As it turns out, the army's barber division is massively inefficient and charges $900 for a haircut, which Hank refuses to pay out of principle. So he writes to his congressman about the overcharge, and soon, the barber program is cut from the budget, with Bill losing his job. But Hank receives a check from the army for saving them from overspending, and he uses it to repurchase Bill's old chair from the army surplus auction, donating it to the base so all the other dissatisfied soldiers can re-establish the program in secret. Hank puts a lot of value to the consistency in his life, so much so that he's willing to risk his haircut on a senile barber purely because that's the way his hair has always been cut. 
but when this source of comfort in his life is threatened by the man losing it, it's his fear of Bill's ineptitude that combined with his fear of change that puts a barrier between the two. Though from Bill's perspective, all he sees is a large fear of him. He doesn't quite understand all of Hank's reservations about getting his hair cut by somebody else. And yet it's this trust that ends up being betrayed by a third party to Hank and Bill. Bill is a great barber, very knowledgeable about his craft and experienced at practicing it. It's one of the few things about his life that he still has to feel good about. But upon losing his ability to cut hair, he loses the only thing left to him except for his friend group, which he also loses from what he views as a betrayal. Not only a betrayal of his friend circle, but one by his own country, which had not only been exploiting his services for decades, but were also prepared to cut him entirely at the first opportunity. Thankfully, by the episode's conclusion, Hank is able to use his money from the suit to get Bill's old job back, repairing both severed connections in one action. Meet the Propaniacs Hank has Bobby working at Strickland over the summer despite the boy wanting to go to a comedy camp instead. But when a summer sale goes south due to a short supply of inventory, Bobby's able to save the event by doing a comedy routine about propane that's so successful even Hank laughs. So Buck gets the idea to put together a group which they name the Propaniacs, doing comedy shows around Arlen to motivate the other Strickland employees. They eventually get the attention of Charlie Fortner, the president of the Texas Association of Propane Dealers, to do their skit at a regional convention. But when Bobby has the idea to bring Charlie up on stage for their routine, Joe Jack gets nervous and arrives drunk during the show, resulting in some bad improv that makes Fortner believe that the entire skit was a means of revealing that he wore adult diapers. He forbids them from performing at any official propane establishment ever again, but Hank, upon seeing how upset Bobby is about their performance being shut down, simply stages another one at a local mall. This performance bombs, however, the audience being totally uninterested, all except for Hank. So Bobby simply performs to his father instead, not caring if anybody else is laughing. Hank and Bobby have found common ground a few times throughout the show's run up to this point, but this is usually after some kind of revelation from either character occurring at the very end of the episode, like Hank accepting Bobby as a rodeo clown only after Bobby proves himself useful. But this episode differs from this emerging formula by instead having the moment where the two bond occurring at the beginning of the episode, during the first act. Bobby combining his comedy routine with Hank's love and knowledge of propane results in something that they can finally do together, and this is something that only gets built upon as the episode progresses. But it's been shown that this is still a somewhat one-sided understanding between the two. Hank is willing to let the Propaniacs disband over Charlie Fortner telling him to stop performing, with Hank believing that the skits were all about promoting propane. Bobby is also about to give up when he bombs in front of an audience that doesn't find propane-based humor funny. But when he realizes that it makes his dad happy, he also realizes that's all that really matters. It's not about what other people think about your relationship, it's about what the people in the relationship itself feel. Nancy's Boys Hank saves a man trapped in a freezer and gets a free dinner for four, and Dale invites himself and Nancy to go with Hank and Peggy. But during that night, Dale's able to rekindle the dead marriage he and Nancy have, and the two sleep together, though Nancy feels terrible about this as she views it as cheating on John Redcorn. This leads to an argument that results in Nancy going back to Dale again, but then a jealous John Redcorn enters their house at night, and Dale smashes a lamp over his head. Fearing that he's hurt the man who massages his wife, he tries to apologize to both of them, realizing that his wife has had headaches for 14 years and he's been neglecting her. So Dale, in secret, goes to John Redcorn's trailer and teaches him about the Freedom of Information Act. The two begin to bond over their mutual dislike of the federal government as Dale starts to strain himself helping with the request forms. But when Nancy gets ignored by both men, she goes to John Redcorn's to apologize and sees both the men together. And John Redcorn finally apologizes to Dale for the years of healing his wife, saying that he can't continue to see her in good faith and that Dale should be the one to treat her headaches from then on. The infidelity in Nancy's relationships is played with in this episode, bringing up an interesting point about who it is that she's really cheating on. She's been married to Dale for about 20 years as of the end of season 3, and she's been seeing John Redcorn for 14 of those years. Considering that her relationship with Dale has been emotionally dead for at least that long, she's arguably closer to John Redcorn than she is to Dale. While legally and morally it's Dale that she's cheating on, to her, she's John Redcorn's woman. The emotional connection being the thing that most would focus on in her shoes. 
All three characters in this relationship have wronged one another in some way, though there are some larger than others. Dale admits he's never been emotionally receptive to Nancy through their marriage. Nancy is, of course, cheating on Dale, and John Redcorn is sleeping with the married woman with no regard for the position it puts her or her husband in. And yet this two-timing actually ends up getting in the way of what could have been decent relationships. Dale and John Redcorn are shown to have a lot in common, being genuinely happy with the other man's distrust of the federal government and bonding over their work to get their vision of justice. Dale and Nancy even find their relationship rekindled after ignoring one another for so long, assuming there was nothing left to their marriage and then not bothering to try to improve it. And of course, it took John Redcorn finally meeting Dale to realize that he ought to consider that the person who may be best for Nancy might not be him. Flush with Power Arlen is in a drought, and Stage 3 water restrictions enforced by the Board of Zoning and Resources prevent Hank from watering his lawn, making it worse than cons. So he decides to install new low-flow toilets that the Board has pushed, in order to reduce his water usage, though he's appalled to discover that they require multiple flushes to function, often using more water than the old designs. Hank then tries to push a repeal of the ordinance that banned the old toilets, taking a position on the board to get the resolution passed, though it's shot down repeatedly and Chairman Hashaway tries to bribe Hank to drop the issue. When Hank refuses the bribe, he blackmails him instead, with photos of Bobby using Khan's hose to water the Hill family lawn, which is part of an agreement with the Sufa Nusenfone family that Bobby worked out after blackmailing Khan once he caught the guy bribing the water company's employee to allow him to ignore the restrictions. When Bobby notices that the new low-flow toilets are made by a company that Hashaway owns, he tells Hank, who uses Peggy's help to filibuster the board until the members all have to use the bathroom, forcing them to realize the new low-flow toilets are subpar and vote in favor of Hank's appeal. There is a lot of blackmail going on behind the scenes in this episode, but above it all stands Hank, who never allows himself to be corrupted by any of the many influences. Khan bribes the water company to ignore his water usage, and Bobby uses his information to blackmail him into allowing him to take baths at his house. This agreement then changes to letting Bobby use the hose to water Hank's lawn, an example of two wrong things being done for a person's benefit, much in the same way that Dale gets approval for his new fence, or Hank is offered to have the old, illegal toilets installed. But Hank refuses this, and even refuses to stoop to using Hashaway's involvement in the production of the toilets to get the guy removed, using a filibuster to prove his point about the toilets' inefficiency so the council members will vote based on the issue rather than anything else. It's Hank's love of democracy and his hatred of subverting it that drives him during this episode. He loves his lawn, but is willing to let it die before he compromises his ideals. He loves democracy and is unwilling to subvert it for his own benefit, or even the long-term benefit of the board by getting Hashaway removed from his position for corruption, preferring that his resolution pass purely on its own merits. Because at the end of the day, it's about capital R right and capital W wrong. If you have to circumvent order to prove a point, then it likely wasn't the right point to make. Transnational Amusements presents Peggy's Magic Sex Feet. Peggy runs out of the bowling alley embarrassed when they try to announce her shoe size over the microphone, and later, when trying to buy bowling shoes of her own at a big and tall woman's shoe store, she hears about a man who can make her feet feel beautiful. That man is Grant Trimble, who asks her if she's okay with creating an educational video involving her feet to raise the spirits of other women with oversized feet. But while describing the process to Hank, the rest of the alley overhears her, and they find the website her video was posted on, a foot fetish site. Hank visits the man to tell him off when he learns of this and then informs Peggy of the real nature of the site. But when she complains, he informs her that her videos can be inspiring to everyone, which Peggy buys into when he compliments her more. Though later on, some creative differences between the two result in Grant dropping the facade and offering to pay her for her quote, big ugly feet. Realizing that his flattery was fake, she begins to cry in her room when Bobby comes in and cheers her up by comparing his weight to her shoes that he's not ashamed of his fatness, so she shouldn't be ashamed of hers either. This is the episode where Peggy gets tricked into starring in a pornographic movie. Ordinarily, this is the sort of plot reserved for a ditzy character in her college years, although even that trope largely ignores the real-world parallel of the story, usually involving less tricking and more forcing, but here it's given to a middle-aged woman. And while it would be easy to attribute this to Peggy being unintelligent, her motives come more so from being self-conscious than anything else. It just takes a bit of flattery to convince her to do something in such a lewd vein. She's convinced that she can help others feel good about themselves, the same way that Grant Trimble did to her. 
just like other episodes such as Death and Texas, this episode has Peggy coming from a place of good intentions, though instead of selling drugs and hurting others, she's selling smut and hurting herself. By the third act of the episode, she's in a worse mental state than she was at the beginning due to the fact that some sort of happiness was dangled in front of her face, only to be suddenly taken away. This mirrors the beginning of the season where Peggy had thought she'd be able to reinvigorate her life with a child, only to instead fall from a plane and give up on the dream. In that episode, it was Cotton's similar life experience that got her back on her feet, literally, and here the episode comes from Bobby. He gives Peggy the same speech that Hank did, but this time around it's framed not as another person loving her, but a person loving himself. Bobby knows that there's more to him than his weight, and Peggy remembers there's more to her than her feet. Peggy's Fanfare Peggy sends song lyrics to Randy Travis and gets a canned response from his lawyer, though she misconstrues this as proof that she's a good songwriter. The United Arlen Methodist Church goes to the Fanfare Country Music Festival, a suggestion by Peggy, which makes her believe she ought to be in charge of the whole trip. But once they're there, she hears Randy Travis's newest song, which shares a remarkable similarity to hers. She attacks him, accusing him of stealing her work, though he tries to calm her down by saying that similar songs are made all the time. Hank believes him, but Peggy does not, and this escalates to a feud between the couple when Randy also steals her childhood stories as well. Peggy starts to realize that Hank doesn't believe her, and calls her crazy. Meanwhile, Bobby is having trouble with Connie, though Brooks and Dunn manage to talk him through it and he gives the duo one of Peggy's desserts as a thank you, although he drops it near some horse dung along the way, resulting in Brooks getting terribly sick. While trying to TP Randy Travis's trailer, Peggy and the alley accidentally knock it into a lake with him inside. Hank has to jump in and save the man, though he believes that Peggy pushed it in maliciously. She tries to bring her other Apple Brown Betty to him as an apology, though is stopped by security who point out that it's similar to a dessert that had poisoned another during the fair. Though Hank vouches for her, eating the dessert to prove that it's clean, and the charges are dropped, though Hank still wants to punch Randy Travis when he claims that he was the one who saved Hank's life. Peggy's ego is a form of flanderization, a process through which characters in a long-running show steadily become characterized by stereotypes about their personality rather than the more nuanced depictions they used to be. In my opinion, this is an aspect of her character that really started to become more pronounced as of the start of season 4, and yet due to this episode being at the end of season 4 and thus produced before audience reception to the season could be seen and reacted to, this means that an episode of this nature has to come around as an internal reaction to the character. The writers and showrunners themselves viewed this change in Peggy's personality as they were developing the character and could design episodes like this around their own observations. It's this sort of familiarity with one's own cast that makes for a good television writer. Being able to notice trends and developments before the audience can is what makes the characters feel real. This is an episode about Peggy Hill as a concept rather than a person, and having this understanding of your own characters is both a cause and effect of why the cast is so relatable to audiences. You can understand them as well as you can understand a real person. And people love stories about people who feel real, celebrity guest stars notwithstanding. Outro This was part one of what will likely be a three-part series covering King of the Hill. Part two will come out eventually, and part three will be out ideally after that, unless I go really crazy. This whole section will be cut out of the inevitable full version of the video, so I can use it to give a bit of a channel update or talk about things unrelated to the show itself. I've hinted at the beginning of the video that I live in Texas. I've lived here my entire life, my childhood split between living on a cattle ranch and a middle-class suburb. And yet, despite being able to connect with so many members of the cast throughout re-watching the show for this video, I don't feel like it was my unique experiences that enabled me to do so. Rather, I think it's the strength of King of the Hill's character writing that made the characters relatable in this way. I didn't relate to them, and they related to me, and everyone else. Growing up, I always found King of the Hill to be a much less interesting show than things like The Simpsons or any of the other sillier cartoons that aired alongside it, though it has aged much better than everything else because of the exact same reason I found it tedious as a child. The experiences of the characters were explored with enough nuance that goes over a child's head, but manages to present something more compelling to the mind of an adult. King of the Hill is a show that doesn't really let itself be watched passively. You have to pay attention to catch the subtleties, and the more you put in, the more you get out. This is why I made the video in the first place. This is why I made this entire channel in the first place. Some shows really do have an extra little layer of depth that rewards careful exploration of the themes and characters, 
And I'm glad that you watched this video the whole way through, because it means you likely feel the same way. Or, you know, that you left YouTube playing while you slept or played a game in another window, which, fair, I mostly watched this show as a child while playing MapleStory on the family computer, hence the music choices, and I still developed a place in my memories for it. I'll tell you what, 